Sandwich, Swiss cream sandwich baked by Nabisco. The luscious creamy fillings in a class by itself. No other like it. And these tempting vanilla cookies are so light they melt in your mouth. Yoo-hoo-hoo, yoo-hoo. It's Swiss cream sandwich. Oh, yoo-hoo-hoo, yoo-hoo. And yoo-hoo-hoo, Swiss cream sandwich. Well, you're going to be tested on that song later to see if you can sing it. <laughs> I love it. You <laughs> Oh boy. It's interesting when advertising is being done. Let me get some lights on here. It's interesting when advertising is being done how they will stereotype uh certain cultures. You know what I mean? They just do. And uh when you think of the Swiss Alps and you think of Switzerland, you think of the yodeling and, you know, people wearing that cute little suit and outfit, kind of like our dear friend right here. She kind of looks like she could belong in the Swiss Alps, doesn't she? Yeah. And so, you know, they stereotype, they do an advertisement like that by Nabisco and they um, are driving home the fact of the wholesomeness and the mountain air fresh and the blah, 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 blah. Reality is, those things were probably about as fattening and not so good for me as my Oreos. But you know what? It's advertising. And so when they were first coming out with some of the earliest models of the Elnas, let's, let's go into the history a little bit on Elna, shall we? Obviously, by that intro commercial that vintage commercial, you know that even if you're brand new to VSM Space, if you're brand new to this channel, that Elnas originally were made in Switzerland. They're Swiss sewing machines. And I can tell you from having worked on this one in depth, they built them back then very much like Swiss watches. Lots of teeny tiny parts, lots of intricacy to the mechanisms in the machine you got to know what you're doing you don't want to be a general tinkerer and sit down to one of these elnas from the 1950s and say oh, i'm just gonna mess around and see what i can figure out i would not recommend that they are even more persnickety even more sensitive than the swedish beauties uh, when it comes to the intricacy of their mechanisms and, and what they require to be sewing a page 34 stitch. They just really don't dabble. Don't dabble. Uh, send it into the workshop and I'll be glad to get it right for you. So we on screen right now are looking at a classic Elna 2, also known as an Elna Supermatic. Well, and you're saying, again, even if you're brand new to VSM, well, okay, there, this is the Elna 2. There must have been an Elna 1, right? Yeah, yeah. So let's look at that a little bit more. But before I go any further, I should put my brakes on and tell you that this machine belongs to Dawn. And specifically, if I understood correctly, belonged to Dan, uh, to Dan, to Dawn's grandmother, I better get a drink of water or my tongue is just going to be blah, 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 all through this. This machine belonged to Dawn's grandmother. And Dawn and Michelle, if you've been following me closely, you, you know what I'm talking about already. Michelle and Dawn and another friend drove in from Cass City, Michigan last summer. Last summer with three machines. And all of these machines had very specific needs. There was 
a Seeger 66-1 from 1923 that I'm not even I'm not even going to get into the needs of that machine. If you somehow miss the premiere, then you're going to have to seek out that premiere. It's Michelle's 66-1 from 1923. That is one of the biggest projects that I've done recently, that's for sure. Uh, then they also brought a 1959 Singer 192K, which is also known as the, the Spartan. I call it the Mighty Spartan. It was anything but mighty when it arrived at the workshop, but that machine also has already been premiered, and it is absolutely a Mighty Spartan now. Uh, unbelievable machine. And Spartans, again, are those machines that were kind of the bare-bones, plain-Jane version of the 99K and the 99. They were no frills, no fancy uh, filigree or decaling, bare-bones machines, but they had a bigger motor, a 0.8 amp motor. And so that's one of the big attractions of those machines for a lot of people is you've got twice the power of a Singer Featherweight, but the Spartan, the 99K, and the 99 are all going to be shorter in overall bed length than the Featherweight 221. I'm not making it up. It's absolute fact. So a lot of great Singer machines there uh, for sure. And then last but certainly not least is the machine that we're premiering today. The yoo hoo 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 uh, a machine from Switzerland, uh, the Elna Supermatic, also known as the Elna 2. So a little bit about the history of the Elna Sewing Machine Company. So believe it or not, the roots of the Elna Sewing Machine Company are not Swiss. They actually are Spanish. So if there's any watchers out there right now around the world that are watching this channel and your roots or your family's roots are Spanish, you can sit up a little bit taller in your chair because those are the actual roots of the Elna Sewing Machine Company. And they go all the way back to a Spanish engineer by the name of Dr. Ramon Robert. You want to be real formal. Dr. Ramon C. Robert was his middle initial. So he returns home to see his parents right around 1933, right? Back home to visit the family. And after completing his studies abroad, he's home with his family and he's asked to repair an old sewing machine. They give it to him, so he has the opportunity to study the mechanism in this machine. And he becomes totally absorbed. He's, he's totally enraptured in the mechanics being an engineer. Does that make you think of anybody else recently that I did a premiere on? Someone that I interviewed in the UK that also has an engineering background? Should I do the... Wait, wait, I forgot to ring the bell. I should have done it right then. Yeah, Alex Askarov. Alex, my friend from the UK that I interviewed recently, also went to engineering school in the UK. And so this gentleman that has the roots of the Elna Sewing Machine Company, a Spaniard, is sitting down as an engineer to this machine, and he just becomes enthralled with it. And he remembers he had friends who had a corset factory, and he paid them a visit. And he ended up seeing some of the machines that they had in their operation, which included some of those machines that my buddy from Colorado, Dusty, just loves. They're the industrial style, style ones with a cylinder style arm where you can put tubular pieces of fabric and you can sew them on these machines. And so his inventor's mind just goes nuts. 
and he starts to think about housewives. He starts to think about the ladies at home that would love to be able to do sewing and repair trouser legs and sleeves, etc., etc., etc. And he realizes that the dimensions on these cylinder industrial machines, they're just too bulky. So he comes up, comes up with an idea of wanting to develop, develop a machine that has a smaller free arm that would accommodate housewives. And that gives birth to the first modern household sewing machine with a free arm, and it was conceived by this Spanish engineer. And he comes out with kind of a rough prototype right around 1934. The machine design included a free arm, built-in motor, and a light as well that was kind of recessed into the housing. It had a unique carrying case as well that could become part of the sewing platform for the machine. You could basically take the machine out of the carrying case and then make that carrying case part of the sewing platform that you could use as workspace. That was pretty doggone progressive back in the early 1930s. Singer is only a couple years earlier, or, you know, that's not even correct. Singer, right around the same time, 33, 34, is rallying up for their big debut of the Singer Featherweight at the Chicago World's Fair. And at the very same time, this Spanish engineer, right in the same time frame, is coming up with this really cool prototype that's going to have a free arm and is also going to have this case that can kind of that can kind of convert into workspace for the machine. So a lot of cool things are coming about in that same time frame of 1933-34 on the Elna side and on the Singer side. How cool is that? Now you might be saying, okay, we're talking 30s when this first prototype comes on the scene with Dr. Ramon C. Robert, right? He's our Spanish buddy that comes up with the original concept that ends up growing into the Elna Swiss-based sewing machine company, right? So how does that all come about? Well, he eventually ends up migrating to the Geneva area and continues to work on the mechanisms, work on the prototype, work on the design concept that eventually will grow into the very first machine that comes out of his factory, which is none other than drum roll, fanfare, blah ha ha ha, the Elna One, right? So again, going back to the inception of this, we're talking early 30s, right? It's not until right around 1940, almost a decade later, that the first real machine comes out of that Elna sewing machine factory, which is now based in Switzerland. Right around 1940. And then they run with this machine, this Elna 1, right around until 1952. So about 12 years. And the Elna 1 is going to have some of the same characteristics of this Elna 2, but instead of being able to detach the knee controller that plugs into the front of this Elna 2, the Elna 1 had one that was basically attached to the machine. You had to kind of collapse it accordion style, fold it into the machine, then you had to tuck it into that cool little case that also served as workspace as well for the machine. And it was just kind of a, a bother to the, the ladies of the day, primarily some men, that were using that Elna 1. And by the time they started to get into the 1950s, 51, 52 time frame, and they got a lot of feedback from the users, and they said, hey, you know what? We like the knee control. It's great. But do you have to, like, mount it to the machine? Could we be able to take it off, maybe? Could we be able to detach it? And so by the time this machine that belongs to, originally, Dawn's grandmother, 
by the time this machine was coming on this, the, the uh, scene, just a few, late, few years later, again, the Elna 1 was in production from 1940 to about 1952. By the time the Elna 2 came on the scene, right around 1956, they had gotten the message loud and clear. When we do this Elna 2, we need to allow that knee controller to be detached from the machine because folks don't, they don't like it being stuck to the machine. So that's what they decided to do. Along with that, they came out with some really cool cam functions as well with the Elna 2, also known later as the Elna Supermatic. And they even added that branding to the machine as well. Because it's just kind of plain. I mean, if you've got a marketing strategy team huddled around the table in Switzerland, and they're saying, so, we have great success with the Elna 1, and now we're going to come out with the Elna 2. Could we come up with another clever name to call it? Other than yoda lada loo 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 hoo hoo yeah, why don't we call it a Supermatic? Because it's really kind of super. I mean, we're going to add all of these cool cam functions to it. We're going to still have the awesome free arm that our founder, uh, Dr. Robert uh, C., excuse me, Dr. Ramon C. Robert. Try to get that in order when you're on a live premiere. <laughs> so they added some other cool stuff to it by the time it rolled out in 1956. And it really was an incredible machine, although surprisingly, they didn't run the production cycle as long on the Elna 2 as they did on the Elna 1. Type in the chat if you remember me saying the dates that they produced the Elna 1. Type it in the chat right now. And while you're doing that, I'm going to get a drink of water because I am just a jabbering Swiss yodelulu today for sure. All right, so if you typed in the chat, because you're really fast typers, the Elna 1 was in production from around 1940 until 1952, 12 years. But surprisingly, the Elna 2 was only in its original form, only in production for about two years, from 1956 until 1958. That was the original rollout of it. Now, they did carry it forward in other forms all the way into the 1960s. They made slight adaptations to it, little tweaks here, little tweaks there, and their, their next major production group uh, after the initial rollout of the uh, Elna 2, again from 1956 to 1958, would have been from 1958 until 1963. And then it, they did a third rollout of the Elna 2 from 1963 to 1964. And then they went totally a different direction in 1964, rolling out the Elna Star Series, which was a totally, tra totally transformed, almost looked like a modernistic type version of the original Elnas, had a little bit, you know, a little bit more plastic on it than metal originally, uh, than the original ones, I should say, had more dials on the front, uh, was a little bit more contemporary looking than some of the much earlier Elnas that rolled out, like the Elna 1, Elna 2. So I'm not a big fan of the Star Series, to be honest with you. I love these classic uh, Elnas, the Elna 1, Elna 2. Some people refer to them because of the color as grasshoppers. And, uh, I don't think the Swiss would embrace that very well. They're beautiful, sleek, sexy Swiss yodel machines being called grasshoppers. But a lot of people do it anyway. They're going to do what they're going to want to do when they want to do it. Yeah, they are. So there you go. But let's just take a quick walk around this machine, if that's okay with you. And I'll point out some of the basic features of this Elna 2, a.k.a. 
Elna Supermatic. And I'll come off the tripod to do that so we can get a little bit closer to the machine. Not that close. <laughs> I'll tell you what, real quick, let me put on some music while we're doing this. And it's not going to be yodeling music, sorry. All right, where am I? I've got a lot of windows open on this computer right now. That's the wrong one. There's the right one. All right. Bear with me for a second. All right. So, meet the Elna 2 up close and personal, okay? So if you've never seen an Elna sewing machine before, you're brand new to VSM, you're brand new to this channel, and you're going, I didn't even know that there was such a thing as an Elna. I've heard of grasshoppers, but not an Elna sewing machine. So this particular one is going to have a knee controller. It's basically a metal rod. You could probably also carry it in your car if you're traveling to a large city and use it as a self-defense weapon of some sort. Yeah. But for our purposes, you're going to slide it in the front of this little plug-in point here. Kind of slide it in like that. It goes into that little notch. See that little notch right there? And then you just let it go. And then if we push on this to the right, it's going to engage that motor. So we don't want that to happen right now accidentally. So I'm going to unplug it again. See, on the Elna 1, we couldn't have done that unless you broke out like a, a, a toolbox of tools and then disconnected it. But we've already talked about housewives, ladies in general, are very, very powerful influencers of what happens in the marketplace. And they certainly influenced a lot of the outcomes with this later edition Elna 2 from the original Elna 1. So you already know about this. This is how we make the machine run with that knee controller. And then as we move up here, we're going to be in our stitch length control region right here. If you, get, if you look real close, you'll see there's kind of a zero in the middle there. If you go to the bottom part of that zero, you're going to be sewing in reverse with that stitch length range of basically one through four. You'll also notice a funny little A right there. That funny little A is a special feature on this machine, and I'm actually going to refer to the manual so that I actually, instead of making up words like I usually do, uh, I'll actually use the language of our friends in Switzerland that came up with the concept. Okay, let me get to that page. So, <clears throat> nope, that's the wrong page. Hold on a second, I'm almost there. Okay. So when you're gonna be sewing with, now let me let me kind of bounce around. I'm gonna go from there to over here real quick. So when you're gonna be using these cool cams that come with this machine, there are simple cams, as the Swiss were, refer to them. There's basically gonna be a total of four simple cams, and then there's gonna be these double cams. And the double Elna discs, as they're also referred to by the Swiss, are going to need a certain setting in order to use them. Okay? And the certain setting is going to be this A right here. You're going to slide that control down, and it's going to basically click into place. We'll actually do that right now. We're going to move it all the way down. Okay, so now we're at zero. We're going to keep on moving. Listen, wait for it, wait for it. <gasps> it clicked! So when it clicks into place on the A, that's where you're going to set it to use these double discs, these super thick, like double stuffed Oreos. Hey, why don't I just make up names for some of these because it's more fun. So when you're going to use the double stuffed disc that the Swiss came up with, this, this one right here, okay? When you're going to use one of these, you're going to have to set it on A in that stitch length control area. And you're moving it then into what's called uniform feed. Uniform feed, okay? They also call it 
varied feeding of cloth. They've got all kinds of terms, okay? In essence, what it's going to do with all those terms and all that blah, 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 when you're showing with one of these double-stuffed discs, what it's going to do, it's going to, it's going to take absolute control over the automatic functions of the machine to include the feed dog function. So as soon as you move it into this range, that double stuffed disc that you have in the machine is going to control feed, it's going to control stitch length, it's going to control stitch width, it's going to control everything. It's going to take absolute domination over the machine. The other thing you'll notice about this little cool little control right here it's got a little arrow on it and a little plus and minus let me get really close to that hopefully without it becoming blurred what this little doodad is is when you're sewing with uh, different cam type uh, functions of the machine this is your fine tuner so you're able to fine tune some of the stitch outputs the length of it and we've seen this on other machines presented in different ways where you can fine tune the cam output of the stitches. That's what this little doodad does. You're going to turn it different directions to either increase or decrease the natural output of what these cams will generate. Okay? So that's kind of a neat little thing. If you don't like the look of it, you can tweak it a little bit. Just going to see if this so they they refer to this so i get it right i don't get any nasty notes from my buddies and my friends ladies and men and others in switzerland they call it the stitch fine tuner the stitch tuner to be really short okay and when you when you're done sewing with your double stuffed cams like these or discs as the swiss refer to them you're then going to push this little button down and move it back up into this range and then you can resume sewing. So we're sewing in reverse right now down here. We're now sewing forward when we get up into this range. Now the trick about the discs, let me talk about the discs real quick. The trick about the discs as we access them by opening this little door right here. <gasps> Shazam! The trick about these discs is you always have to move your stitch length and your stitch width to zero when you're either putting them in or when you're taking them out. Let me say that again, it's very, very important. They actually underline it in the owner's manual. I, I think they highlighted it too and maybe even circled it in crayon. Swiss people like crayons, I'm sorry if that offends you, but it, it's true, okay? So the real big deal here is when you're putting a cam in, this is actually uh, cam number one, one of the simple cams when you're putting a cam in when you're taking a cam out you need to move your stitch length to zero right there I think I'm on zero yeah and you need to move your stitch width which is this right here you also need to move this down to zero as well so zero on stitch width zero on stitch length. Now we can take the cam out or we can put the cam in. How do you get this cam out of there? How does that sucker come out? Do you need tools? Do you need a screwdriver like this? Uh, no. A dental tool? Maybe a mirror? Uh, no. All you gotta do is just push down on this. <gasps> and it ejects! And by the way, the Swiss, the Swiss call this area right here, they call it their Elna Graph. G-R-A-P-H, I believe. The Elna Graph. They also refer to it as the brain center of the machine. They obviously don't know what the heck they're talking about because all of you know the brain center on any sewing machine is going to be the raceway where all the magic happens in the stitches being created. So I don't know why they came up with that. It's kind of silly. But anyway, once you push down on that, I'm holding a camera too. You can kind of wiggle this up, sort of, with one hand. Ah! You can wiggle it up and you can take it off. So now we have one of the simple discs off. And 
to put it back on, we're going to do the reverse of what we did, but again, making sure that our stitch width is on zero, making sure that our stitch length, where is my finger? Making sure that our stitch length is also on zero. Yeah, it is. And then, I don't know if I can do this one-handed, but I'm going to give it a go. Then you'll notice that there's a little pin on their cam stack right here. That little pin right there. Okay. We're going to line up our little circle right there with that pin because there's a hole on the back side of it that we need to match up. You can tell that I did lubricate the Elna graph area because there's just a little bit of oil residue on that simple disc. See, I got it right that time. I didn't call it a cam. I call it a simple disc because that's what the sweet that's what the Swiss call it. And then when you put it onto the stack, you're going to line up that little circle. And I'm doing this one-handed, folks. So you're going to line up that little circle with that little stem that sticks up, and you're going to gently push down until it locks into place, which it just did. So again, now I can go into sewing. Whenever you don't have uh, another important point, whenever you don't, let's you know, let's just assume that this is not there. There's no disc in the machine right now. Okay, it's not there. The Swiss caution us that you should never, ever, 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 ever operate the machine without a disc unless the stitch width is down on zero. So if this disc is not here. <laughs> Shazam, it's gone. Just pretend it's not there. Use your imagination. Go to your happy place and use your imagination. Pretend there's no disc. Okay, it's gone. It's pretty good, actually. It looks like it is gone. <gasps> okay, it's gone. Pretend that it's gone. There's no disc in there. Your cat took it, okay, to play with. You cannot operate this machine then unless you put the stitch width on zero. Never operate this machine above the zero if there's no disc in it okay it'll damage the elna graph the brain center as the swiss call it so since we have a disc in there we're good to go now we can move our stitch width over here from one to four we can move our stitch length since we're going to be sewing forward above the zero demarcation line somewhere between one and four the swiss like one, two, three, four. They don't want to do five or six or something like that. So, yeah. Look at that. It's kind of fun. We should have music on right now. So right now we're ready to use this cam if we choose to do it. Does that make sense? All those little blah, blah, blahs that I said? So let's say we're, we're, we're done using this disc. Just your, use your imagination again. We've already sewn something with it. We're done using this disc. Can we remove it right now? Type in the chat. Can we remove that disc right now? Hopefully you said no. Hopefully you said no. Hopefully you said something like, no, Scott, you know, if you're, if you're done with that disc and you want to put a different disc in there, another simple disc or a double stuffed Oreo disc, then you've got to move this stitch width controller down to zero and you need to move this stitch length controller also to zero. Now, Scott, you can remove that disc by pushing that little doodad down and making it pop up, right? So give yourself an A in the class for the day and a pat on the back if you got that answer right, because that is really, really, really important so you don't damage your Elna 2, a.k.a. Elna Supermatic, okay? Follow those principles, and you will live victoriously. Yes, you will. So I'm going to move this back kind of, eh, I'm not going to go all the way for the max. I'm going to move up to about 2. And then you can also, you probably already know this, but you can screw this down to kind of lock it in place if you want to, but it, I, I don't think you need to do that. These are your boundary setters. Kind of like you've seen on Singers and other ones. You can unscrew this and set your top boundary. You can unscrew this and set your bottom boundary as well if you want to do that. We're probably not going to use those today because we're rebels and we don't like boundaries, do we? No, we don't. We don't like boundaries. 
So that is our Elna graph or our brain center for our Elna 2. Okay? All right, let's close the door. Should we close it? All right. Yeah. All right, let's close it. That is the sound of quality, isn't it? But another thing to point out about this Elna 2 real quick while we're talking about quality is... This magnet is not sticking to it. Is that plastic? No, it's metal. It's aluminum. Yeah, we can get it, get it to stick probably here. Yeah, that's probably aluminum too. Let's open our uh, Elna graph again. <gasps> yeah, metal. Metal, metal, metal. Hope I didn't just dislodge it. Yeah, and there's some other metal in there as well. So yeah, this is a, a lightweight portable machine. It's going to be comprised primarily of uh, aluminum. And we could scrape scrape off the edges of it and do our tests on it to see if it's magnesium. But I can say with a high degree of certainty it is not a magnesium-based machine. And if you didn't see that premiere I did recently where I tested, I, I, we kind of turned our workshop playroom into a science lab. And I did all kinds of tests with fire, with baking soda to determine whether or not a free Westinghouse golden machine was magnesium or aluminum. If you didn't catch that, you'll want to check it out. It's pretty cool. It's a pretty cool premiere and a, a video that's on the channel right now. What else can I show you about this machine that's kind of groovy and cool? So if we go over here, <clears throat> let's actually look at, before I forget to cover it, let's look, look at the general threading of this machine, okay? I wouldn't say it's super tricky, uh, but the manual, Swiss people are very smart, but they don't make the greatest manuals as far as the directions making a whole lot of sense. So we've got two spools, uh, pins on the back. Tells you right away that you can dual needle or twin needle sew with this uh, Swiss made Elna 2. You kind of follow it along here and you go through this thread guide, this thread guide, then you go through the back of the machine. Actually, where, where am I? You actually go through the back of the machine. Let me get my flashlight out. It's kind of dark back there. Hold on. You go through the back of the machine where you actually access the tension area. The upper tension area is kind of like back over here. And you have to draw that thread through the discs back there. Again, always making sure your presser foot lever is in your presser foot lever right here is in the up position so there's no pressure on those discs. So you draw the thread through the back of there, right where you can see the numbering, just to the right of that actually, as I'm looking at it to the right of it. And then you're gonna draw that thread to the front of the machine. Shut my flashlight off now. And it comes through those discs. Make sure that thread is drawn through those discs. You kind of bring the thread over the top of this little guide bar right here, up through your take-up arm, from left to right, follow it back down through this thread guide. And then there's another thread guide on the side of the needle right there. You see that? And then finally, you're going to thread this machine from front to back. Okay? Now, the cool thing about this machine when it comes to accessing um, and cleaning and maintaining the machine is if you apply a little bit of pressure right here you can pop this door open and you can see the bobbin in there very readily now if that's not enough to see and I'm gonna try this with one hand which is a little bit crazy but if that's not enough to see here you know what I'm not gonna try it I'm gonna go back up on the tripod and then I'll have two hands to do the next little step that I want to show you okay All right, let's zoom in on that. Right about there, I think should be pretty good. Oh, I want to show you something else too as far as setting this up for sewing in relation to that bobbin, okay? Because it's a little bit tricky. And there's nothing on the, there's nothing on YouTube. I was just curious if anyone had put resource videos out there about setting this up for sewing when it comes to uh, the bobbin case. No one's got anything out there. And the one video where someone kind of posted something, it's so poorly done, you can't tell what the heck they're talking about. I mean, I couldn't anyway. So, 
me flip my screen around. Let me put on a little bit more music for us to yodel, yodel, yodel with. That's the wrong one. Click over there, buddy. All right. And I was feeling, uh, I was feeling trumpetish today. So I put on the keyword search for my YouTube songs, the word trumpet. So you're going to hear a lot of trumpets today. I think part of that was inspired by my buddy Bill O from Kissimmee, Florida, sent me a note giving me an update on a bugle restoration that he's doing. And uh, so I'm thinking of bugles and trumpets now. It's just it's what I do. Okay, so you open up this little back panel. That's when you can drop your bobbin in. This bobbin is a little bit tricky to set up. Let me show you what I mean. If you can visualize out of view, and it's really hard to see, I, in order to illustrate it, I actually got my little mirror out and I kind of stuck it back there so I could see. And maybe, maybe I'll be able to show it to you that way too. That would be really cool. But if you can imagine this bobbin carrier is mounted horizontally in the raceway, and when you draw that thread through the center little slat that's back here, you have to draw the thread down to the right and then kind of bring it back up to the left to get it to snap in there. It's almost like if you use this as an illustration, I hope it'll be helpful. If you use this as an illustration of kind of how that's positioned into that raceway area, with this being the opening where you want that thread to go because then it's gonna be under the tension band, you have to kind of draw that thread through the opening like this you have to kind of draw it down and then you have to kind of draw it back up so it goes into that slot like that and all of the descriptions online even the owner's manual leaves a lot to be desired I mean you're like what what, what do you do again it's just but just think of it think of that uh, opening where you want to get that thread into that bobbin carrier as you're going to bring, be bringing it through a center slot you're going to be bringing it down to the right and then kind of back to the left to get it to snap in kind of like I'm doing right now okay I hope that's helpful it uh, there's a lot of confusion out there right now about setting up that aspect of the machine but getting back to this if, if you want to be able to do some real detail cleaning in here you don't have to take off this free arm cover, these four screws, like I saw a couple people in a Facebook uh, uh, group chatting about. They said, yeah, if you want to clean uh, your feed dog area out, you have to take off that cover for the, the uh, free arm. Take out those four screws. You can't probably see all the four screws, but there's four screws that hold the free arm on. That's absolutely not correct. This actually can snap out this piece right here without taking the free arm off. You kind of pull it up and it pops out just like so. Okay? And then when you want to put it back into place again, you just kind of position it in there, snap it back into place again. Okay? And then just check your thread to make sure that, uh, you know, nothing's, nothing's gotten stuck or jammed or anything like that. But I really wanted to highlight that because that really is a point of confusion for folks. Another point of confusion for a lot of the folks on the Elna 2 is how do you get the faceplate open? And I'm not going to actually open it because I've got the machine threaded right now, but I'm going to tell you, I'm actually going to show you how to do that. We're off the tripod again. This is crazy. We're rebels. We're rebels. Hold on. We'll stay right there while I pick out another song. Uh, let's see. Hold on a second. I'm actually going to go to my auto auto library. That way I don't have to keep clicking the button. I'm going to be lazy. I'm going to be lazy. And then we'll come off the tripod and I'll show you what confuses uh, quite a few folks as far as uh, getting that faceplate open for servicing and for other things. All right, so I have to trump in, type in trumpet again. Trumpet, yes. All right, you're gonna hear some of the same songs, cause, but it's gonna be automatic now. So sorry about that. At least I'm not gonna play that Swiss commercial again for you right away. All right, so let me show you about the faceplate real quick. 
Because again, it's just amazing to me that there's not a lot of people that are willing to share these answers, or maybe they don't know the answers uh, on the internet. So right, where is it? It's back here somewhere. I know it was here before. Somebody took it away. It's really kind of hard to see. Let me zoom in on it. Okay, this again is gonna be our upper tension uh, dial right above that. See that little metal tab? You're gonna push that this way in order to release the, uh, the lock basically on the face plate. So you're gonna push this this direction and then you'll, and there's still gonna be a lot of tension on this, but then you can open this right here, just pop it open like that, okay? So I wanted to show that to you as well. I'm trying to think if there's anything else I wanted to show you. General bobbin winding is, is fairly straightforward on this. You're gonna basically take, you can either put another spool on here on this spool pin right here, where you normally would put your second spool for twin needle sewing. You're then gonna come through this thread guide right here, just like we are when we're sewing. And then you're gonna come straight back over to here. Some people run the thread on this side over here. I just run it straight over on this side. And then you'll wind it around your bobbin and then engage it here like so, like I just did. And then disengage your clutch. This is your clutch over here. You obviously hold this and then turn this towards you to disengage your clutch when you're bobbin winding. Um, on off switch for light and power right here. It's kind of fun, isn't it? Don't you wish you were here and you could do that? Yeah, you do. And then also over here, you've got your nomenclature plate. They don't give amperage on this machine, but I'm going to rate it between about 0.8 to 1 amp. It's going to be right around a 1 amp machine. Uh, and uh, plenty of power. Unique thing about this, and we'll kind of cover this when we go through the progress shots on uh, Facebook, uh, you can see everything that the Swiss like to contain every, everything inside. They kind of tuck it away, almost like the Italians with the Necky machines. When you take this balance wheel off, like I did for servicing, you discover all of a sudden that this machine does not have a belt on it. You remember that free Westinghouse we recently did, the Premier on, and I showed you that friction wheel, uh, it's called a friction pulley, that engages with the balance wheel from the rear of the machine on the free Westinghouse machine? Were you asleep during that class? You remember it, I know you do. Well, the Swiss have taken that technology of the friction pulley and they put it inside of the machine. So when you slide this balance wheel on, it makes contact with a friction wheel on the inside of the pillar and that's what's gonna drive the machine. So while you never need to replace a belt on this Elna 2, you may have to replace that uh, friction pulley just like I did on that free Westinghouse. But when I went through this machine, the friction wheel still has a lot the friction pulley still has a lot of life left to it, so I did not replace that. I don't think it's needed at this time, but I'll be glad to do that for Dawn uh, in the future if it becomes a need. What else? Oh, I almost missed something really important. The other thing I wanted to show you, I've, I've talked about this, I've talked about this, I've talked about the A, I've talked about all this blah, 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 blah. This is another important control right here. And this is gonna give you control over needle position. It's gonna be like a little dial, like a radio. You're gonna move it one way or another way to manipulate the position of that needle uh, down by the sewing area, okay? Almost forgot that. That would have been horrible. That would have been horrible. What else? Oh yeah, yeah, up here, duh. Up here is gonna be uh, presser foot pressure. Obviously the further you go, this way, away, you know, put making that uh, plus symbol go this way, uh, you're going to be increasing presser foot pressure. Pushing the dial this way to the left, you're going to be decreasing presser foot pressure. And again, the simple rule is when you're sewing real light stuff like cottons, uh, satin, silk, uh, that sort of thing, you're going to be decreasing this presser foot pressure. Uh, when you're sewing leathers and other heavier materials or multiple layers, you're going to be increasing the presser foot pressure. Okay, if that makes sense, type in the chat, thumbs up, smiley face, something like that if you wouldn't mind. Okay. 
So I think that's a pretty comprehensive, you know, overview, if you will, of the Elna 2, just to set you up for success. If you either have one or you're, you acquire one or you're thinking about acquiring one uh, or something like that. Off-camera sew-offs, I didn't do a ton on this machine. I did some of this, uh, um, looking at the nap now. This actually looks like, this is Italian leather. Um, I did some Italian leather once I got the machine fully done. And uh, this Elna uh, 2 did a fabulous job laying down page 34 stitching, top stitch, uh, and also the lock stitch as well. What else did I sew? Oh, I was goofing around with some of the uh, simple discs, and I put together two pieces of heavy grade denim, and I laid down some of the simple disc type sewing patterns as well. And then this looks like it might be. I think this is vet. I'm looking at it again. This looks like it's vegetable tan leather, and I also did a single layer of this. Uh, testing stitch quality after I got done with the service. I generally, unless a machine has a specific diagnosis, uh, it's been diagnosed with a specific issue and I want to test something from the stitch output, I go through my entire process, which is over 100 steps on this Swiss machine, uh, and then I do my very first sew off because I don't even want to see what it's doing at the beginning unless I have a, uh, you know, unless the customer says to me straight away, uh, it's got tension issues. Then I'm going to do sew-offs before so I can see what it's doing or it's making a grinding sound or, or whatever. Then I'll be doing some test sewing-offs and I'll, I'll be, you know, looking at that straight away. But otherwise, I usually will wait because it's, it's almost kind of an exciting anticipation. I've gone through my process. I've readied the machine. The ready machine, you know, it's just been totally optimized. And then I put material underneath that presser foot for the first time. So I kind of go back and forth a little bit. Um, oh, another thing to show you. Uh, we're going to be using this needle today. It's a size 90, 14, size 14, 90 European size. Uh, and it's going to be a Schmetz leather needle. So that'll work for, great for the leather. It may be a little bit more of a challenge with some of the other materials we sew off on. We'll have to wait and see. And our thread today is just a standard Coates and Clark dual dual duty uh, type thread that we're going to be using. Nothing fancy, uh, just a basic dual duty, right around a 30 weight thread. Okay, yeah. And this is a, a little caddy that comes with the machine as well. I'll just show you. You can put your extra cams in there, your double Oreo cams, your uh, simple discs as well. And then you can put some of your extra attachments in some of these other little cubbies. And then you just slide this right over the underneath the free arm when you're storing it. So, yeah. Did I forget anything? I did a brilliant job? What, are you from England? I thought you were from Switzerland. Oh, you can say brilliant in any language, right? Yeah, I'm a pretty smart guy. Yeah, although I'm still very much a student. Very much a student. All the time, pretty much. Yeah. All right. Let's get this back up on the tripod. Zoom back in by the machine. Well, I hope the tips that I've given you so far are helpful to you. Again, um, a lot of the places you go, there's not a lot of resources out there about the illness. People are a little bit gun shy about posting stuff so hopefully some of this proves to be helpful for you so what first sew off should we do what do you think and i'll move some of these uh, simple discs and everything out of the way let's see Yeah, we'll do a straight stitch. And to set it up for straight stitching, I'll just show you real quick. We're going to obviously set our stitch width right here on zero. And we're going to be setting our stitch length. I always like to go max, so I set my stitch length on four. So we should get a nice, full, robust straight stitch. Yeah. 
And this is another great illustrative point right here. Uh, as we were uh, going around the back of the machine, I was showing you uh, how to thread it. I was showing you uh, the little release for the faceplate and everything. Um, you'll notice right now the presser foot is in the load, lowered position. It's, in, in the, it's, it's up against the feed dogs. You never operate a machine this way, even if it's unthreaded, uh, whatever. You always have material between the presser foot attachment and the feed dogs when you're operating the machine. Now, if you want to raise the presser foot, then you could run the machine. If it's unthreaded, uh, you could run the machine as much as you want because the presser foot attachment and the, the feed dogs are not making contact with each other. But as it is right now, never operate it this way. It will create scarring on the bottom of the presser foot attachment and it will dull the feed dogs, okay? So uh, make note of that, share that far and wide with your circle of friends that uh, do any type of sewing. It's true of VSM space, it's true of more contemporary machines as well. So, yeah. We learn all kinds of things in this classroom, don't we? Yeah, we do. Kind of fun. All right, so we're set up for a basic straight stitch right now. Why don't we do something outrageous like actually sew something? All right, so I'm going to move the simple discs off to the side here. We'll probably use some of those again. And I'm going to launch with, I'm going to launch with, some of this uh, Elkite, single layer of it. If you're brand new to this channel, uh, know that Elkhide is uh, some pretty tricky stuff uh, to sew. Just checking something really quick. That should be adequate. I was just adjusting the uh, presser foot pressure a little bit because we're sewing something heavier now, obviously. All right, so a single layer of uh, genuine Elkite chemically processed about three to four ounces of leather, and we're going to be sewing. Uh, through it using this size 90 14 uh, Schmetz leather needle. Now the other thing I did not mention, and I should, I'm plugging in this uh, knee controller now. What I didn't mention is when you're setting this machine up for sewing, the book recommends that you set it up about five inches from the edge. And I think we're pretty much close to that but you'll want to you'll want to offset it about five inches or so from the edge. Uh, I'm out a little bit far, farther than I need to be, but uh, it'll it should work beautifully. So I just wanted to point that out as well. But you can look at that uh, Elkhide from the side and see uh, straight away. It's uh, it's anything but lightweight leather. All right, let's give this a go. specifically intend to launch into it that aggressively, but well, there you go. Beautiful stitching. Beautiful stitching. Wait till you see this. And what I, what I do, for me at least, because I'm kind of snugged in here by the machine, is I will take out that, uh, that knee controller when I'm working close to the machine trying to show you guys stuff and everything, just so I don't bump it incidentally. Oh, that's so weird. This leather piece I chose 
has the, the strangest little dimple chunk out of it there that we just sewed through. Kind of weird, huh? Let's see if I can balance it here, otherwise we'll get out the uh, sew-off holder thing. I think that might work. We'll give it a try, huh? We'll give it a try. See if we can see that clearly enough, otherwise we'll get all our stitch uh, stitch off holder. Yeah, I think that's pretty good. So again, about, about four ounces of elk hide. You can see it on the upper edge right there. It's like a basically like a man's belt. Kind of go across and look at those stitches. Pause there. Folks, I don't know what you're seeing, but I'm seeing some absolutely rock solid page 34 stitching, at least for that top stitch. And again, look at the thickness from the edge. Totality of the stitching, we're all quite a ways, aren't we? Totality of stitching is also just spot on. It presents really well. It's a, it's a rock solid top stitch. And if you were sewing a product uh, or something you were looking to, you know, to do for a family member as a special project around the holidays, uh, that's a gorgeous looking stitch. Let's look at that lock stitch and see what we think. I'm making this so much more difficult than I need to balancing it like this, but it's kind of fun. All right, so this is our lock stitch through a single layer of uh, genuine elk hide. Let's take a look at this and see what we think. Pause right there. Pause right there. Folks, I'm going to give that a solid page 34 on this lock stitch as well. Again, a lock stitch is going to be more difficult for the machine to complete because it's having to work against friction and gravity to pull that thread back up through that thick layer of leather. So it, this Elna did a fabulous job. And uh, I didn't really mean to give it as much gas as I did, but I'm not used to pressing the knee controller. I just don't use knee controllers all the time. And I've got fairly strong legs from all my walking, as you've seen in the Facebook shots. So, yeah, we launched. We, we just rocked and rolled. And that was only a fraction of that motor strength, uh, even as aggressively as it went after this elk hide. So I'm going to throw that to the side as a definite pass as one of our first, well, our first on-camera sew-off. And it did a brilliant job. It really did. A brilliant job. So what next? We could do that. That's true. We could do that. That was a great suggestion, Mr. Bean. Great suggestion. All right, let's grab our elk hide back again. This is the one that we just sewed. And I have another piece cut already. And I think what I'd like to do is do a second layer Elnas are oftentimes praised for their uh, their their beautiful stitches, uh, decorative stitches or ornamental type stitching, but they're not oftentimes thought of as a muscular machine. Kind of like that commercial, that vintage commercial that we watched at the launch of this. Um, kind of a delicate, you know. They you think of Swiss as delicate, pretty. That sort of thing. You don't think of it as robust and strong, but that certainly isn't true. So I think we'll we'll go ahead and attempt to do two layers of elk hide, just to demonstrate that Swiss people are also strong. And look at that from the side. What we're going to attempt. That's insane. That's about eight to ten ounces of leather. Those of you that like measurements, that's about four to five millimeters thick. 
and we're going to see how this machine can handle this task. It's not going to be easy. It's not going to be easy at all. I mean, look at that. It's kind of scary, especially using a standard dual duty, dual duty type thread with only a size 90 uh, needle. I don't know. This might be too much. This might be too much. Not not for the machine to get through it. I, I I'm, I'm confident that that can happen. But how will it do as far as page 34 stitching? How will it do as far as page 34 stitching? That's the only thing I'm questioning. We'll see. You know if I can fit this underneath there, and there's no hyperextension. There's no hyperextension on these uh, Elna twos. That may be too thick. Looks like really generous uh, presser foot clearance, but I'm having trouble fitting these two layers through there. You may have to pass on this. Doggone it. Oh, I wanted to do that. I so much wanted to do that. We'll do two layers of other leathers, but this is going to be a little bit too thick to get over those feed dogs, unfortunately. Doggone it. Ugh. So I guess a fair criticism then of uh, the Elna 2 is that maybe there's not quite as much clearance as we would like underneath that presser foot. Okay, well in lieu of that we'll go with this single layer of elk hide that we haven't sewed yet and we'll drop down our disc number one simple stitch on top of it. So to do that it's really a bummer. Dang damn it. Well I can't control that. It is what it is. So <clears throat> So let's lay down a simple stitch number one on this single layer of Al-Qaeda, which again is no small task. And to set it up for doing that, come out right about to there. The only adjustment we need to make, because the, the uh, simple disc is already in there, um, is we have to move our stitch width right here from zero to somewhere between one and four. I'm going to put it probably right around on debating two or three. I'm going to do three and then I'll move my stitch length up here from four down to about three as well just to kind of mirror and match it. Those are the only two changes I made. Not going to change needle position. I don't need to set any boundaries. We're going to leave that alone. We don't need to move it down to the A because we're, we're sewing with a, a simple disc. We're not sewing with a double Oreo disc. Yeah. Oh, I'm loving this groove. Anyone else loving this groove right now? I hope you are. Mr. Bean, come on. He is such a goofball, isn't he? All right, let's get this done. Let's see what we think of this uh, simple disc number one. I'm going to plug my uh, knee controller back in 
and I'll try to be a little bit less crazy about the power this time, although that was kind of fun, wasn't it? All right, here we go. Make sure my take-up arm is at the highest position. Clutch is locked. All right, here we go. Perfect timing. Perfect timing with the song, wasn't it? Yeah, it was. It's kind of fun, isn't it? So what they're calling a simple pattern number one is almost what I would call kind of a snaky pattern, isn't it? Let's take a closer look at that. Yeah, the, in, in fairness to Elna, uh, in fairness to Elna, the, the feed dogs on these Elna 2s, and certainly other Elna models as well, are really robust feed dogs. And they tend to stick up a little bit higher, they're a little bit more meaty than some of the other standard feed dogs out there, so it kind of gets in the way of giving a little bit more clearance underneath that presser foot, unfortunately. Kind of a bummer. That's okay. That's okay. Take a look at these stitches. Actually, we're already taking a look at them. The wonder of technology. Look at it again from the side and the top. The thickness of that elk hide and all of the needle swing that has to be accomplished to lay down a stitch pattern like this off of a simple disc uh, number one. Folks, I'm going to declare that as a solid page 34 look at totality of stitching. Can you imagine that on a, on a garment or something like that? Just a beautiful stitch. And again, we can manipulate stitch width and stitch length when we're using a simple disc in order to make that you know tighter, make it longer, whatever we want to do with it, we can goof around with it. So that's just the way that I chose to sew it. If you have an Elna 2, you can move that stitch width from a 3 to maybe a 1 and just see what, what you think of the look of that as you lay it down on a similar leather or some other type of material. Let's take a look at that lock stitch. This is a fun song, isn't it? This kind of feels Swiss, doesn't it? I'm feeling rather Swiss right now. Well, and I'll do a shameless plug as well. And this, is, this has a little bit of a nap, so we may have a little bit of trouble seeing some of the stitch definition, but right there where the, the nap is cooperating with us, and you can see solid page 34 lock stitch through this single layer of Al-Qaeda laying down this, uh, this simple disc pattern number one. Beautiful, beautiful stitching totality of the stitching now this is somehow appropriate this song isn't it kind of has a, has a Spanish flavor to it and uh, with the roots of Elna being with that Spanish engineer you remember his name Dr. Ramon C. Robert Dr. Ramon C. Robert so this is a definite pass I'm going to go ahead and move this to the back as well. Beautiful stitching, beautiful stitching. Oh, I take that back, this is not really Spanish as much as it maybe Hawaiian music or African music. Maybe it's African Spanish Hawaiian music. I'll go with that. Why don't we go to the light side now? What do you think? Let's go to the light side. So in order to do that, we're going to go up here to our presser foot adjuster. 
Right now we're on the plus end. We're gonna move it a little bit to the left to lighten up that presser foot pressure just slightly. I don't wanna to take too much away. I don't wanna to take too much away, but we'll move it right around to that center position right there. That's kind of the default position right there where you see the two uh, little V's, if you will, with the center marker in the middle. This is kind of our default where uh, the Swiss Elna makers would recommend that we use this for most of the settings as we're sewing materials. So we're gonna follow the recommendation. We'll try it on 100% cotton, we'll try it on satin, and we'll also try it on 100% polyester ribbon material and see how it works for us. If we get bunching or we get other challenges, then we know that we could push that dial more towards that negative on the right, which would mean pushing it like this. And then it'll lessen that uh, presser foot pressure, but we'll try it there to begin with, just to see what we get. So we'll do these three sew-offs on the light side, and then, I love this music, don't you? And then we're gonna move over to Facebook and take a look at some progress shots. Well, the trickiest of these light sew-offs is going to be this uh, this satin. So I think we'll do the satin first. I'm going to get that underneath the presser foot. Lower that down. And I'm debating if I want to try to lay down this uh, decorative snaky pattern on this or not. I think I'll probably go with a straight stitch first. So let me do that. I'm gonna move this to straight. So I'm just sliding our stitch width control over to zero. And then our stitch length, I'm gonna shorten up just a little bit. Um, instead of doing a four, I'll probably do a two on uh, the stitch, stitch length. Now this feels more like Spanish music, doesn't it? Yeah. Let me get a drink real quick. If you want to get a drink as well, that would be totally fine. <laughs> All right, let's give this a go and see how this Elna can manage a super light sew off with this 100% satin. I'm a little bit nervous just because, I mean, this stuff is tricky, but I'm very, very confident in how I prepared this machine. So we'll see how the machine does in managing this super on the light side so off. All right, here we go. I think it did a brilliant job in feeding. That's very impressive. Very impressive. I may have set that stitch length a little bit on the short side though. And part of that might be also, we're gonna sew that a second time. I'm gonna increase the stitch length and also bump up our presser foot pressure to a little bit higher than it is right now. I, again, I think we I think we did fine. I think we did really well, but I just want to test that to see what impact, if any, it brings. Because if you if you're sewing something super lightweight like this, as we saw in a recent premiere that I did, if you're sewing super, something super lightweight like this and you don't have enough presser foot pressure, it's actually going to compress the stitches. It's going to make them smaller. So we're going to sew this one more time. Off camera, on top, I'm bumping up that presser foot pressure a little bit higher, and then I'm taking our stitch length control and moving it from right around two 
to the max and we'll see what impact that has. Again, satin is a tricky, tricky material to be sewing, especially with a standard presser foot attachment. A lot of people will go to a walking foot, they'll go to a roller foot in particular with materials like this, but we'll see what we think. And maybe by increasing the presser foot pressure right now, maybe we'll get bunching like we did not get the first time. We'll have to wait and see. All right, so take up arm is at the highest position. Let's see what impact we brought with these subtle changes. Here we go. So no real bunching issues. In general, it fed pretty well. But again, we're sewing. Here, here's the other dynamic that we didn't mention. Here's the other dynamic. We're sewing satin with a leather needle, which generally not a good idea. Not a real, real, real good idea. I'm also looking at my upper tension as well that I have right now set right about on seven. And that's also gonna impact our top stitch, isn't it? That's gonna muscle that bobbin carrier down there in uh, not giving us as well of a defined top stitch as we could have otherwise. Let's see what we think. Have all kinds of things in play, don't we? All kinds of things in play. Yeah, that's okay. We're smart, we can figure it out. Okay, so let's see what we think of this. I'm gonna set this stitch off kind of like this. I've seen on the satin that it's sometimes easier to see the stitches by laying it down instead of by trying to lean it up. We'll see what we think. We can always lean it up if we need to. Okay, let's take a look at these. So the first one, we weren't, we weren't quite in the satin range, but we were pretty teeny tiny on that straight stitch. And then we increased it, we also bumped up our um, presser foot pressure as well. having trouble seeing it there. Let me try let me try setting it up on our sew off holder and see if we're able to see it a little bit better that way. But I can already see that with that upper tension as high as I had it that uh, our, our top stitch is not going to be as defined as it could be otherwise. That's for that's for absolute sure. Alright let me balance that on there and we'll move the camera down and look at it on this uh, stitch off holder and see what we think. Yeah, our, our top stitch is going to be underserved on this sew off and we could, if we have enough room, we could sew it one more time and try to impact that, but that's definitely, the top stitch is underserved. Our smaller stitch was able to manage that um, better because it's tighter together, it doesn't stretch it out as far. I think we'll do it one more time after we look at the lock stitch. All right, totality of the stitching. I'm not going to give this a page 34, I'm going to give it a near page 34 because we know what we need to do. But let's flip it over and look at that lock stitch, see what we think of that. Now I am going to, I am going to give this uh, lock stitch a page 34. I'm seeing some really good stitch definition on this super thin, slippery satin, and it managed both that very, very close to satin stitch and regular stitch uh, beautifully. You can particularly see it uh, near the end, near the end of that stitch row right there. 
some really, really good looking stitching. I'm just going to move it a little bit more. Actually, I'm going to move it right over to here. I, mean, I think it's off a little bit as far as viewing that stitching. Let's take it over here. Yeah, yeah it is. That's a little bit clear to see. So I'm going to give that. I'm going to give the lock stitch a page 34. I'm going to give the uh, the um, top stitch a near page 34. And we're going to what we're going to do is I'm going to adjust this uh, upper tension. Right right now you can't see the numbers because they're facing the other side, but we're right around seven. I'm going to bump this back a little bit, and we're going to sew this one more time and see what impact we can bring to give greater definition to that top stitch. We know what to do, and I actually want to take the time to do it. All right, let me get our material. Whoops. That's why I take that, uh, that knee controller out. I just bumped it. Oh, gumdrops. That's the only downfall of a knee controller is that you're moving back and forth by the machine, particularly, particularly if you're doing a um, premiere like this. It's so easy to bump that knee controller like I just did. Thankfully, I didn't bump it long or we would have really had a mess. All right, let's give this a go again and see if we can give some of the victory back to that bobbin carrier down in the raceway. So I'm going to sew this right next to our other uh, top stitches that we just did. But first of all, I'm going to make an adjustment on that upper tension. Right now we're right around, I, I said seven, we're actually like around six and a half. So I'm going to back it up a little bit down to just a little bit below six. And we'll see what impact that brings. Again, right now we have an underserved top stitch where it's not defined clearly. So we just backed off our upper tension so that that bobbin carrier is not being overpowered and it can pull down more to define that top stitch. So let's see if we were successful when we get down to the end to see if we have better definition. Okay, here we go. Oh yeah, that's definitely heading the right way. That is definitely heading the right way. I'll show you what I mean in just a second. I could have even gone just a little bit further probably, but we're gonna leave it like that for right now. Oh, that is such a difference. See that when we know what the issue is, I'm going to take that knee controller off before I bump it again. When we know what the issue is, we're able to address it and bring bring the solution into place. All right, let's. I'm going to take this over by our stitch off holder, and uh, and we're going to look at this side first. As a matter of fact, so I don't get confused, I'm actually going to put a T for top stitch. I'll put it right here. It's not very bright, is it? Well, that's supposed to be a T, but it really isn't. My Sharpie must be dried out a little bit. Two of these 
sharpies. Let's see if that's going to be a little bit more clear. Yeah, that's clear enough. We know that's our top stitch. Okay, I'm going to set it up on this stitch off over here. We'll look at this and then we'll... And the other thing you have to balance is you have to balance the factor of not going too far with that adjustment. Otherwise, you're going to steal too much from the lock stitch. You know what I mean? All right, let's take a look at this. Well, we definitely are heading the right direction. We definitely are heading the right direction. All right, let's take a look at these. Actually, I need to angle it just a little bit more. I can see that. And I'm going to look at all three at the same time so we can just see what impact we brought. This again is our top stitch. That's supposed to be a T. Just use, use your imagination. Oh yeah, this is definitely Spanish now. Smooth that I think I'm going to be able to see these better if I lay them down. I'm going to give up on this. Let's see if that works better. It's so hard to see that definition on this. Yeah, I think that's a little bit better. We're definitely going the right direction. Let's look at uh, totality of the stitching. And then I'm gonna flip it over and we're gonna look at that lock stitch. So part of what we're looking at here is if we impacted adversely that lock stitch. So yeah, I'm looking at the, the definition. We didn't cause any loss for that lock stitch at all. Let me come out a little bit so I can stop jiggling the camera. That top row is the last one that we did. We still have a very good looking lock stitch. As a matter of fact, we could even taken that, we could have taken that upper tension even down a little bit more so that we could even make that top stitch pop more. But we're definitely heading in the right way and we didn't go too far for sure because we still have some really, really good look, looking lock stitching. So if I were sewing a ton of this satin, I would back off that upper tension even more. Probably another, you know, probably another half step or so to take a little bit more away from this lock sti st stitch and give a little bit more to that top stitch. This is real tricky material, but we're definitely able to manage it well with this machine. And it's just a matter of, of making a couple more little tweaks on it. Again, we're sewing a wide field of materials here and that inevitably will require some adjusting as far as that tension. Uh, because of the uh, the thickness factor and just the nature of the material we're sewing. So I'm incredibly pleased with this, incredibly pleased in how this Elna 2 managed a very tricky sew-off with this satin. Alright, let me move that to the back with our elk hide. And we're going to be going into our 100% polyester next. Uh, this ribbon material and trying to lay down, uh, we'll do both uh, 
we'll basically mirror and match it with what we did on that other material. We're going to be doing a uh, straight stitch of different lengths. I almost say we're going to be doing a decorative stitch, which we've done on ribbon material before, but... There we go. I think that's pretty set. So ribbon material is a little bit has a little bit more rigidity and a little bit more uh, texture to it than that satin. So I'm not going to make any adjustment at this point, at least with the initial sew off on that upper tension. We're going to leave it just like it is. We're right around uh, five and three quarters right now is where we're set five and three quarters on the upper tension. I'm gonna leave the press foot pressure the same. Uh, I'm gonna leave the stitch length the same as well. Get my V controller back in. <clears throat> and we'll try this 100% polyester with this dramatic music playing in the background. All right, here we go. Take up arms at the highest position. Here we go. See that? You can actually control the speed very nicely with uh, the knee controller. You don't have to launch into it aggressively like I did initially. Now that I'm getting a little bit more of a feeling for this. Oh, is that gorgeous stitching. Now that we've got a, a fairly solid sweet spot for uh, the lighter side of sewing, uh, we I think we nailed this uh, ribbon material on the very first sew-off. I'm almost inclined to try a decorative sew-off with it for fun. Let's do that. Let me clip these, uh, these threads and they will jump right into a decorative sew-off, which won't require anything other than taking our stitch width from zero uh, over to the stitch width setting that we choose to, uh, to pick. Let me try this one more time. So I'm moving my stitch width from zero and I'm probably going to move it over to like two. And again in classroom we should be reinforcing our learning, right? <clears throat> So once again on this Elna 2, our stitch width is right over here, and I'm going to be moving it from 0 over to 2. Our stitch length is up here, and I'm going to be moving it from 4 down to right around 2, right about where we are now. Not going to do anything with our needle position, and we're going to go ahead and try to lay down a decorative style stitch going down this very, very tricky 100% polyester ribbon material. Let's see what we think of this. I guess we ran out all of our trumpet music, didn't we? That's okay. We're going to sew this next one in total silence so that you can hear this Elna running and just how beautifully whisper quiet it runs. It's got kind of a fun little humming almost as, as it's going. It's kind of, it's kind of cool. I like it. All right, here we go. Two layers of 100% polyester ribbon material laying down uh, a decorative type stitch off of uh, disc number one that's inserted in the machine right now. All right, here we go. Oh my goodness. Dawn Grandma's machine is very, very happy. Very, very happy. Alright, let's give this a clip and check these out. And again, we're dealing with uh, sewing decorative at a decorative level right now with disc number one simple disc number one to be very specific and uh, we're using a size 9014 leather needle with dual duty Coates and Clark 30 weight thread 
So if we can balance it against there or not, probably not. No, it's like it's going to fall over. So I'm going to set it on this stitch off holder and we'll take a look at those stitches. See what we think. <clears throat> I better take off that knee controller before I bump it again. Let's check those out. So we did um, a straight stitch to begin with. Again, we, we, we have our presser foot pressure a little bit higher than the prescribed level right now. Let me show that to you real quick again, just to reinforce. So we're a little bit higher than it recommends for general sewing, but that's okay because we're going to be uh, we're going to be bumping it up even higher when we move back into leathers again. We lay down a straight stitch first, and then we lay down the decorative stitch off of the disc number one, the simple disc number one. Folks, do I need to say it? Do I need to say page 34 plus? You were already there, weren't you? Absolutely breathtaking stitching on this very, very tricky 100% polyester. Let's look at totality of the stitching. We can't come out real far because it's it's a super light uh, thread. This camera is driving me bonkers here. It's a super. I'm not touching it right now. It's just it's like got a mind of its own. Go down there and stay. Stay right there. Don't move. Don't move. So if we look at it right there, we can see. I mean, I'm going to say page 34 plus, which means a near perfect plus stitch. It's, it's just fabulous. But I'll tell you one thing, it's, it's hard to beat that, isn't it? The spacing, the formation, the integrity of the stitch, the glory of the stitch is just absolutely breathtaking on this 100% polyester ribbon material. A very tricky sew off. Uh, and yet it's, it's so easy to see how beautifully this Elna 2 just did. It struggled a little bit with that satin, didn't it? But it certainly didn't struggle at all with this 100% polyester. So let's do this. Let's come out a little bit. We'll flip it over and look at the lock stitch. i got to loosen that camera a little bit. Can't even move it. Okay. Let's flip it over and look at the lock stitch and see what we think of that. And in the meantime, I will pick out a little bit more music at the same time. So we must run the course on our trumpet music. So I will type in something else now, like flute. Why don't we type in flute now, see what we get. <clears throat> this is flute music now. Okay, so this is our lock stitch now through these two layers of paper, rice paper thin ribbon material. Straight stitch and a decorative stitch off of simple disc number one. I'm already at page 34 plus folks, I don't know about you a very very tricky sew off and yet this Elna 2 that belongs to Dawn and was Dawn's grandmother's machine you're hard pressed to try to get this any better we're committed to constant and never-ending improvement I don't know what to do to, to make it any better than it is other than maybe sew it without a leather needle <laughs> We used a regular Schmetz universal needle. Uh, we could even improve it further. Let's just leave it at that.
It's unbelievable. Page 34 plus easily. All right, let me take my hand off the camera. We're looking at that lock stitch now. Kind of the totality. I can't go too far out because the, the thread is so light and we're dealing with a pink ribbon material, blah, blah, blah. So yeah, it's, it's absolutely drop dead gorgeous. It's a slam dunk. It's a definite pass. And, uh, and it just reinforces if, you know, as you saw the machine struggling a little bit and we did overcome most of that struggle, I think, in getting that uh, uh, upper tension adjusted so that we give a little bit more definition back to that top stitch. But if you question for even a second that the Elna would, would struggle with light sew-offs, look at that. I mean, it's so evident, page 34 plus. So I'm going to move that to the side along with our elk hide and our satin. And uh, we got one more sew-off to do on the light side. We're going to do 100% cotton next for our quilting fronts. Matter of fact, I have it back here somewhere. No, that's our sew-offs be from before. Where is it? There it is, the red stuff back there. Those are two very thin layers of 100% cotton, which we're gonna target next. Hello. She's beautiful, isn't she? But she's also really stern looking. I wouldn't want her to be my boss. Yeah, that'd be kind of scary. Yes, I know you can hear me talking. I didn't mean it as an insult. I meant it that you're you're very naturally authoritative. Okay? All right. Just take it, take it, take a chill pill. We're good. We're good. <laughs> oh, let's sew cotton, shall we? Let's sew 100 percent cotton. Two layers of 100% cotton. And this is inspired by my dear friend Paula Noel, who uh, always faithfully attended all the premieres, has helped me manage the Facebook page, and she's just a peach. But she said, Scott, love you to death, but could you sew some lighter stuff occasionally? We know that your machines are totally army strong, but we also want to see the softer side. Absolutely. Great suggestion. Thank you again for that, Paula. Uh, so we're, we've done we've done satin. We've done 100% polyester. Now we're going to do this 100% cotton material. I'm just cleaning off my glasses real quick. I don't know how they get dirty so quick. It's one of those mysteries in life. I'm not on a dirt trail. I'm not out in the barn. Although I wouldn't mind being in a barn and doing a premiere. That'd be kind of fun. Yeah. Put that on my list. All right. So now 100% cotton. Two layers of this. We're going to piece these together, just like a quilter would do. And the first stitch that we're going to do is going to be a decorative stitch. And then we're going to move back to a straight stitch. We're going to kind of do them in reverse order this time. All right, are you ready? Here we go. Well, I'll tell you one thing. While the feed dogs being as robust as they are in this Elna 2 limited us limited us from being able to get two layers of elk hide underneath the presser foot effectively. Boy, does it do an excellent job in managing feed, doesn't it? I mean, it just, it just, even with the lightest or the heaviest sew-offs, those feed dogs are just working nonstop to give us victory over the feed factor. And the result is evident when you look at the, uh, the stitching. All right, so we've got a gorgeous decorative stitch. Now, before, we, before I show these to you, I'm going to get this presser foot back into place again, and we're going to lay down a straight stitch. So all I'm changing on the right side of the machine is I'm taking that stitch width from 2 down to 0. And I'm going to leave the... Um, 
No, I'm not. I'm going to move the uh, stitch length from two up to four. I almost said I'm going to leave it, but I'm not. So now we have our stitch width on zero. We have our stitch length on four. And we're going to be laying down um, a straight stitch next to this gorgeous uh, pattern that we just generated using simple disc number one. Here we go. Oh, take a bar. There we go. Now we're ready. Absolutely spectacular. Absolutely spectacular. Wow. Every material is different, uh, especially when you're sewing with a leather needle. Uh, <laughs> so uh, my initial impression of this is it's spot on. But since we're cost, we're committed to constant and never-ending improvement, sewing 100% cotton all day long, I would uh, look at probably just looking at this again. This is our top stitch. I probably would look at bumping down our upper tension just a hair to give a little bit more definition to this top stitch. It's very, very good, but we could make it better. Yeah. Just checking myself that I don't have that upside down, which I might. We did our we did our we did our decorative sew off first. Okay, I think I have it orientated right now. This is going to be our top stitch. That's going to be our lock stitch. Let's let's put it on the sew off holder and we'll take a look at that. Should not have had that third cup of coffee today. Like I said in my Facebook post. I always have two cups of coffee. Today, the uh, the waitress was was just so kind and said, can I top you off one more time, Scott, before you head back to the workshop? I said, sure, yeah, go ahead. Go ahead and do it. Let's live crazy. Let's live crazy. I should have said no. I should have said no! So this is our top stitch. And again, I think, I think we've got a very solid top stitch. But I think we can make it even more solid by bumping that upper tension back. It's definitely page 34, but. Gorgeous, gorgeous stitching. Totality of the stitching. Get my hand off the camera. Folks, that is some gorgeous, gorgeous page 34 stitching. Um, I'm almost leaning towards page 34 plus, but I'm going to hold that plus back for right now. Maybe we'll give a plus to the lock stitch, but that's absolutely bang on. And remember again that we just sewed this 100% cotton paper thin and pieced these two pieces together using a size 9014 leather needle. Leather needle and cotton, that's like oil and water. Let's just face it, it really is. And yet this Elna 2, because of all of my painstaking preparation, getting this machine ready for this premiere, to honor Dawn's grandmother, uh, look at what it accomplished. It really is bragworthy. It truly, truly is bragworthy. Let's flip it over and say, see what we did with that lock stitch. Let's see what we did with that lock stitch. <clears throat> going to turn that just a well let me let me look and see what I think yeah I think we have visibility of it we have visibility I was going to turn it a little bit more but I think we're bang on so this is our lock stitch two paper thin layers of 100% cotton sewn with a leather needle let's see what we think of this
I am already at page 34. I'm still debating the plus. Put a plus in the chat if you think it deserves a plus. Totality of the stitching. I could not be any more impressed with this Elna 2, a.k.a. Elna Supermatic, with how it managed this 100% cotton. It also did an amazing job in managing the other two light sew-offs as well. Even though the satin really, really tried to put it to the test, we were adjusting that to get it to the point where we were moving more confidently towards a page 34. But on this 100% cotton and on the 100% polyester, just an absolute slam dunk on the part of this Elna 2. So it goes to show that managing a light sew off can prove to be as challenging as some of the heavier duty ones that we tackle on these uh, sew off Olympics on these premieres. So I'm going to move this to the back as a definite pass and we're going to move forward now with popping over to Facebook and looking at some of those uh, progress shots. Very, 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 very nice results. Let me move this back to the other side. Okay, let's go over to the uh, computer. So this opening shot is just kind of showing you, if, if you're not familiar with uh, Elna machines, it's kind of giving you a glimpse into seeing uh, what that case looks like. It's all metal, it's rock solid, and the first time you try to load one of these machines into the case, it can be a little bit tricky because as you open that clasp on the front of it, right here, as you open that clasp and you bring that, that, uh, that clasp and that uh, little centerpiece up, you all of a sudden discover very quickly that the rear part of the case is incredibly heavy compared to the front. And so you have to keep a hand on it, otherwise it'll have a tendency to crash to the back as you open it up and you lift it. So let me just, let me give you a caution about that straight away so that what I did the first time I opened one of these doesn't happen to you. It basically crashed back and it almost took out Dr. Singer, uh, who was curious about that Swiss machine, you know, you know what I mean? So just be aware of that. We talk about top heavy, this is, this is butt heavy when it comes to the case. <clears throat> so right away we're having an opportunity to look at that friction wheel that friction pulley that's on the inside of the machine on the right side in the pillar area. And uh, you can just see, uh, starting out, it's got a lot of crud built up on it. It's filthy. It definitely needs uh, some attention. So here I'm actually demonstrating opening the case up, and thankfully I didn't drop it on uh, Dr. Singer or Umi or anyone else. Uh, but again, as you open up that, that little clasp right there on the front and you start to bring that, the, that, that uh, to the up position, just be aware it's, it's, it's going to tip back uh, very quickly. And there is the case kind of opened up. Let me just put a little bit more music on Oh, wrong one. There we go. I think that's that's the correct one, isn't it? Oh, there we go. Close that one so I don't click the wrong one again. Okay, we got it now. I think. So there is the machine sitting inside of the case. It has the caddy on it. 
and you just can kind of see how it's positioned, right? Kind of sits right in the middle there and the two sides come together like a clamshell to close it up. Kind of a cool design. There we've got the front of it rotated down, we've got the back of it rotated down and we just, you can see how the machine kind of sits there. This is going to be different than the earliest prototypes of the Elna 1 that you would take this uh, case then and use it as part of the sewing space. Uh, you could technically do it with this one, but it's not quite as well suited. And there is our Elnagraph area as we're looking at that brain center as the Swiss refer to it, along with our stitch length on the right and our stitch width on the on the right, on the on the left, excuse me, left bottom. And then right around in the center, we've got our needle position. So stitch width, needle position, stitch length. And now we've gotten the case out of the way, and we just have that beautiful machine setting out there. Sliding that knee controller in. Getting that caddy moved out of the way so we can have access to that free arm. We're going to peek inside of that caddy because that caddy has a cover on it as well where you could put extra spools of thread if you wanted. But all the goodies are on the inside. Right after we look at that cool Elna badge mark. And there's the goodies right there. The discs, as the Swiss refer to them, simple discs, uh, double discs, or I like to call them double, double thick or double, you know what I mean, uh, the double discs, and uh, then all the attachments to the right, along with the uh, instruction manual and the cover as well. There's some of those simple discs, the single stack ones. And the double ones are right here to the front. You can see pretty pretty much the contrast right away and the thickness of them. Some of the attachments. And I also, again, you wouldn't get this at a normal service center, but I take all this out of there. I clean the caddy. I clean all those parts, you know, because why would you want to have a leave all the dirt inside of that caddy and then put those attachments, put those discs back in there? and then just basically pick that dirt up and transfer it into the machine that you've just gotten done servicing. It's, it's silly, but a lot of people would do that. So they were just kind of just looking at another angle of that machine. They, they are an attractive, sexy looking machine, aren't they? The Swiss were not going to be left behind by the, uh, the necky people in Italy and, you know, letting Sophia Loren and others that represented the necky brand claim that they were the only sexy machines out there. Uh, the Swiss put that argument to rest very quickly when they came out with these uh, Elna, you know, Elna 1, Elna 2 in particular. Gorgeous, curvaceous, sexy machines. Here we're looking at the side of the balance wheel. Uh, obviously the clutch release, nomenclature plate, on-off switch like I showed you. And then obviously right here you plug your power cord in on the right side of the machine. Here's a closer look at it right there, on-off switch. And again, on this uh, nomenclature plate, you're going to get watts, you're going to get uh, volts, you're going to get uh, uh, ohms, but you're not going to get amperage. But again, I'm estimating that's right around a 1 amp motor. Rear of the machine, again, just a curvaceous, gorgeous, sexy looking machine. Uh, the only difference with this machine versus a lot of others is there is no ac access point on the rear of the machine. Uh, to service it. Uh, you have to service it from the side by taking the balance wheel off or you have to service it from the free arm area by taking the cover off or, or service it for the from the bottom of the machine. Uh, that's the only detractor that I would say if if they had called me up when they were developing the Elna 2 and they said, hey Scott, what do you think? I would have said to them, leave your sexy lines on the back and everything but allow this spool pin area uh, to come off some way so that you can service the, the rear of the machine as well. That would be my only suggestion. 
Better Homes and Gardens sticker. Again, back in the day, back in the, um, I don't know if it was as early as the 40s, but certainly the 50s and 60s, uh, any machine maker that was coming into the U.S. market wanted to get that Better Homes and Gardens sticker. It carried a lot of weight. It had a lot of clout. Uh, just as much as uh, the BBB, uh, the Better, uh, Better Business Bureau, carried a lot of clout uh, back in the day. Not as much anymore. As a matter of fact, there's been a number talking about the BBB credential that a lot of uh, manufacturers love to get a hold of in relation to their products. Uh, the BBB has fallen under a lot of sh sharp criticism because there were some uh, investigative reporter type people that discovered that the people that subscribed to the BBB, you can actually subscribe to the BBB as a business, those that paid... Uh, were sometimes given a lot of forgiveness when it came to people posting things and uh, criticizing that particular company. Uh, there was it, it, basically the, the 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 saying that came along with that criticism was, uh, "Pay to be okay," is what was being said about the BBB. Pay to be okay. So uh, you can take that for what it's worth. So. These endorsements that a lot of the companies would seek either for their company or for their product, there's a two-edged sword there. I think that's what I'm trying to say. So here we've taken off the stop action and also the clutch retainer. Let's see if I can do this right this time. Yay, I did it! So these are just more service points for the machine, more points that have to be addressed. Isn't that a cool looking balance wheel, the way it's designed? You can just see that rim right there that that uh, friction pulley is going to go up against to spin up the machine. And the engineering is, is spot on. It's beautiful. There's our main shaft. Just a lot of service points in there along with the top of the motor. You can see the top of the motor right there in the shot. Now we're kind of looking down into the machine. We're looking at the top of the motor uh, with that uh, friction pulley sticking up. A different concept, but similar in some ways to the Slantomatic Singer machines, where you've got a vertically mounted motor like this, and then coming off the top of it, you've got uh, a, a worm gear that's going to be interlacing with that balance wheel. Slightly different design here, but a similar concept. There's our commutator on the top of the motor, which is obviously a service opportunity. There again is our friction pulley. That makes contact with that balance wheel to drive the machine. A lot of buildup and dirt in there. Can you see that in the shot? Along with our springs and other things that I have to verify, check tensions on, and just make sure everything is good to go. There's our, our uh, main shaft coming off the balance wheel. Look at all the buildup and the filth on there, up here, right there as well. Definitely not the way that it should be looking. I'm gonna verify wiring because there's a lot of wiring on the rear of this uh, plate, this nomenclature plate on the side of the machine. So we're gonna be pulling that out and we're also gonna be sealing off some of the electrical connections as well that right now are wide open and allowing a lot of electricity to leak out. There's the back side of that uh, control area with the on-off switch. And again, you can see all the connection points and all the wiring that we have to verify is, is good to go. Plus, it's dirty as well. Look at all the buildup and the filth in there. More connection points. Also, we've got some, co uh, some copper type relays inside of here as well that have a lot of buildup on them and we've got to get those cleaned up a little bit as well. I check every screw, every bolt on the machine that I can reach, which is pretty much everything. So right now I'm verifying that those screws are nice and snug. I've already checked the electrical wiring, it looks good to go. I've checked the electro electrical connectors, they're good to go. Now we're checking to make sure that they are securely mounted. Uh, I can't tell you so many times I've opened machines of every brand 
and I found screws that are ridiculously loose, almost like somebody loosened them to test me to see if I was going to check it. Uh, I'm totally up to the task on that. Kind of looking at the side shot there, and also our friend from uh, Switzerland has kind of come forward to see what I'm up to. I mean, this is, after all, a machine from her country, and she wants to make sure that, you know, that she's a student. She wants to learn. She wants to explore. She wants to see what I'm up to. <clears throat> and she's not a girl that's afraid to get her hands dirty. Like a lot of you that are part of these premieres, you know, Emma, Maddie, uh, Paula, Sonny, uh, Mindy, uh, and I could go on and on and on and on with all of the regulars that attend these premieres that, you know what, these are gals that will roll their sleeves up and say, let's do it. She's the same way. <clears throat> Trying to get in there and just check some of these connections again just to make sure everything is, uh, is spot on. And also we're going to start doing some insulating on these as well. <clears throat> going after some of that uh, buildup on those uh, copper uh, relays that are towards the center of the, the shot there. Try to use a dental tool and break some of that down. We'll also use a Q-tip swab with some solvent on there to wick some of that off as well. More wiring. Double checking it. That's going to be one of our uh, main uh, timing belts on the machine. And you can see it has a similar design, that tooth design, uh, like you'll see on the, uh, the Foff machines. And you'll see on the, some of the other select uh, makers from Europe love to use that tooth style uh, belt for timing and for drive. I don't know who that is. Oh, I see what I was doing now. Let me go back to that. You guys have heard about my friend Jose that runs the detailing shop real close to the workshop, right? And if you come and visit me here, I'll introduce you to him and take you over to his shop and show you his shop too. He and I become good friends and he wanted to show his appreciation for our friendship and some of the things that I've done to help him out a little bit by getting me a really cool LED band light. And I don't know who the actual maker is. I, I could tell you in another premiere. But it's got a wrap around of LED lights, and then he ended up getting himself one as well, so that when he does detailing inside of the car, like on the uh, the carpet and underneath the seats and that, instead of having a singular singular beam of light, he's got multiple LED lights that kind of wrap around and really, really light up that area beautifully. So thank you, Jose. Appreciate it, buddy. There's what it looks like when it's off. I'm showing our friend from Switzerland. And then I turned it on as well to show her when it lights up. Cool, right? It's a great light, great light. I think we went full circle, that's where we started. So I'm gonna close this set of photos. And our next set, when we get to it, is going to be of uh, our friend from Switzerland uh, showing us the machine and then we're going to kind of launch into some more progress shots from there. Yeah. Really jamming out this flute. Flutes are, you can really jam on flutes if you know what you're doing. I don't happen to know what I'm doing, so. Well, let's do this first. We've, we've used this simple uh, disc number one quite a bit, haven't we? So let's do this. Let's put another of the simple discs. And they basically say that discs 1, 2, 3, and 5, 1, 2, 3, 5, um, are considered the simple discs in this collection. So I think we're going to go to 2 next. Let's see if I can figure out which one is 2. 
Okay, this is going to be two right here, it looks like. Yeah. Let me show you in the shot. I don't know if you're going to be able to see this on camera or not. Oh, let me turn my light back on. That might help. Is that going to zero in in? Let's see if that'll... There we go. I think it kind of came into shot. There we go. Now you can see it. Yay. So that's the pattern that uh, it's considered simple disc number two will do. Uh, is that pattern right on the top there. And you can see on the left side, the 02 Swiss made. Yeah. So this is the one that we'll, we'll do next. And we'll revisit how to properly set up the machine, install it, all that kind of stuff. Let's go right about to there. I wondered why it was a little bit dark over here. It's like, wow, it's kind of dark. I always shut off that light when we're looking at stuff on the computer because otherwise it reflects. Okay, so let's do this. Let me get my towel and just seeing some marks on here that are kind of bothering me. There we go. So let's open our little door. Turn my screen around so I can see what you're seeing. So what's the first thing we need to do? Do you remember? Type in the chat if you remember what we have to do. We're going to be changing out the disc and putting in uh, disc two instead of the one number one that's in there right now. What do we have to do? While you're deciding that, I'm going to grab a, a drink of water real quick. Okay, if you typed in the chat, Scott, we need to move the stitch width to zero, which is where it's at already, and we need to move the stitch length to zero in order to remove the disc properly. If you said that, I am so proud of you because so many people are trying to remove and insert discs on these Elna's uh, without doing that and they're causing damage to the Elnagraph. The Elnagraph! How dare they? Well, there's bottle number one. I'm going to not go too long with this premiere. I might have to excuse myself. All right, so we're on zero here. We're going to move the stitch length down to zero. And now we can remove disc number one and then we'll be, we'll be putting disc number two in. Simple disc number two, I should say. So we push on this, push straight down. It pops up beautifully. Now I have two hands, it's a lot easier. I can kind of wiggle it up. This is disc number one. We're gonna set that to the side. We've already used that. And now we're going to put disc number two in. And again, you'll see a little, um, almost like a little stem sticking up here, right in this area right there. We're going to line that up with our circle. So I'm going to slide it on, kind of get them lined up above each other. And then you put your fingers kind of one in the front, one in the back, and just push it straight down. Oops, I'm a little bit off. Yeah, we're on a live premiere. Why wouldn't it? Give me a hard time. There we go. I was a little bit too far forward with that circle. So, so now we have it locked in place properly. And again, whenever you're putting one of these discs in, whether it's a simple disc or a double disc, always make sure you put your stitch width on zero, your stitch length on zero. Now we can move forward. So I'm gonna set us up for success straight away let see what we're sewing next. We're going to do some protected full grain leather next. So I'm going to move my stitch length up to right around... I set it a little bit shorter. I'm going to go on one and a half. I'm going to set it right on one and a half. So I'm one and a half up here. Again, if you move this into the lower range, you're going to be sewing in reverse. Okay, right now we're on one and a half. And then I'm going to move my stitch width 
to right around two. Cool, all right. So let's get our material underneath the presser foot. And I think I originally intended this material to be um, kind of a sew around the edge type thing, but we're gonna use it differently. Press your foot is down. I'm gonna, before I forget, I'm gonna bump up my presser foot pressure just slightly. I'm gonna double check my uh, stitch length. Right now we're just below six. I'm gonna come up just a hair with it because now we're sewing leather again. Go up just a little bit above six. I think that'll be pretty, pretty spot on. All right, quick verification. Stitch length is set, stitch width is set, nothing with the needle position. We adjusted our upper tension up just slightly because we're sewing leather now instead of one of the lighter sides. All right, we should be good to go. You know, the other thing I should mention real quick when we head over to the needle is, the other thing I should mention real quick is, How do you put a needle in and take it out? You see that screw right on the front there? You lock this in place and then you'll be able to see it maybe. That screw right there, the black one right in the front, this one right here, you turn that loosey-goosey left, you turn that left in order to remove a needle and then when you slide that needle back up into that needle shaft um, all the way, then you'll be tightening it back again, turning it to the right, getting it nice and snug, okay? All right, let's see what we can get as far as we have simple disc number two in there now. And again, this is a single layer of uh, protected full grain leather, probably about three ounces thick. Let me get my uh, knee controller, snap back in. Take up arm at the highest position. All right, here we go. And I'm gonna turn our music down. It's a little bit higher than I want it right now because I want you to be able to hear the beautiful whisper of this machine as it's running. Kind of a whisper, I got attitude. Kind of a soft-spoken New Yorker almost. Yeah. All right, let's give this a go. See what we think. All right, here we go. I almost lost my grip on that leather for a second. It was like, oh, we're gonna go off course. We're gonna go off course. Gorgeous, gorgeous stitching. All these simp all of these simple discs are really, really cool. They're really, really cool. See what we got on that one? It's kind of a snaky pattern. It's just a little bit more curvaceous. It's a little bit more curvaceous. Now we can change the look of that same pattern. So off camera what I'm going to do is I'm going to change our stitch length. Let's see here. We're at about one and a half. I'm going to bring us down to all the way down to one. And then I'm going to make our stitch Output a little bit more narrow. I'm going to take our stitch width from two right down to one as well. There we go. So we basically have one and one. Our stitch length is one, our stitch width is one. Let's sew the same pattern and see what impact we can bring as far as the stitch appearance. All right, are you ready? Take up arm at the highest position. Let's do this again. Here we go.
Ha ha! And in the up position. Yeah. So you can see the impact that we brought. It changes the look entirely of the stitch. And I say that all the time in these premieres. As I'm setting up a machine for different sew-offs, I'll say, this is the way I set it up. But you could change the stitch width or the stitch length and get a totally different outcome. And that's evidenced right here. Let me just clip these other threads and then we'll look at this. That's evidenced right here by our little experiment right there in taking our stitch length down a little bit further, taking our stitch width down a little bit further, and then all of a sudden it looks like we have a totally different stitch, but it's it's exactly the same stitch off of disc number two, disc number two simple stitch. See that? It's kind of fun, isn't it? It just goes to show you if you're doing a project and you say, well, my machine only has 10 stitches or maybe five stitches or maybe two stitches. Maybe it's only a straight and a zigzag. If you decide to be courageous, as I encourage you to be, if you decide to be courageous and manipulate that stitch width and stitch length, all of a sudden your only two stitch machine can create wondrous, wondrous stitches across the board by just adjusting those two factors, stitch width, stitch length. Kind of cool, huh? Come in a little bit. I'm going to take out my knee controller before I bump the machine. Come in just a little bit. And we'll look at these right now. It's obviously our top stitch. Come in a little bit further. There we go. That's how close I wanted to be. Protected full grain leather, folks. Sewn by a delicate, dainty, yodel, lodel, 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 Swiss sewing machine, Elna 2. I'm looking over my shoulder. If you think I'm like way off course, I'm doing my best. Let's look at the lock stitch. Oh, I got a crick in my neck now. Ouch. Our lock stitch is going to be really tough to see. Uh, because this protected full grain leather does have some nappiness to it. But you can just barely catch a glimpse of it, kind of coming through that that nap. I don't know if pulling it back would help or not. Yeah, it does actually. Come up a little bit there. Once I get my fingers in the right place. There you go. See that? How it kind of masks it a little bit till you pull it back? I love this song. I'm trying not to get my foot tapping. That is some absolute page 34 plus stitching, folks. On the top stitch and the lock stitch, absolutely amazing absolutely amazing stitching that this Swiss Elna 2 aka Elna Supermatic just laid down and I'll tell you when we when we did that variation of it the one that's closest to the uh, that's in the foreground we were getting way down there probably around 10 to 12 stitches per inch again on, on this Elna you're gonna have one through four you're not gonna have like on a singer six through 30 or something like that. So you've got to do the own calculation in your mind and say, okay, if I want to get in the satin range, where do I need to be? Well, you need to be somewhere between one to two. Whereas on a singer, you would be in the, you know, 20 to 25 range or maybe even all the way down to 30. So it's a little bit of, of, of a way of 
changing your thinking on it. But, you know, the, the final result is, wow, wow, absolute gorgeous stitching on this protected full grain leather using simple disc number two, simple disc number two. So why don't we, next to these two really cool stitches, why don't we change our settings back to do some good old-fashioned straight stitching, which is really easy to do. All we're going to do is take our two controls. We're going to take our two controls. We're going to move our stitch width from where it's at right now on one over to zero. And then we're going to move our stitch length from where it's right now on one all the way back up to four because I like a long straight stitch. But you know what we'll do is we'll sew a longer straight stitch next to these. Then I'll move my stitch length down into you know the one to two range and we'll lay down a near satin straight stitch next to it. How does that sound? All right, press your foot is down. We're going to concentrate on doing a long straight stitch first and then we'll jump into a satin level straight stitch next to it. Let's go right about there. We may have run out all of our flute songs already. Nope, something's coming on. Just soft. Flutes are generally pretty soft, aren't they? Alright, let me get my knee controller back in. Lay down a straight stitch, longer, and then a real short one after that. See, I'm not lined up real straight there. Okay, that's pretty good. Take a arm at the highest position. Let's go ahead and launch into this. Music is real soft. Listen to this Elna 2 just sing sweet music to us. It's not even yodeling. It's like singing a, a sweet, gentle, soft lullaby like you would hear in, in Switzerland. All right, you ready? Here we go. I just love the sound of that machine. It is just wow. Wow, and look at that straight stitch. You know that? When you use a leather needle to sew leather, you get some really cool results. Who knew? <laughs> Instead of trying to use a leather needle to sew Satin. I mean, what is that about? Scott, really? Really? <laughs> it's fun. It's fun, isn't it? Yeah, it is. It's fun to break the rules a little bit, isn't it? Yeah, it is. All right, so now let's lay down. That's absolutely a gorgeous straight stitch there. Let's lay down. We're going to make an adjustment on the stitch length. We're going to move our stitch length from four almost all the way down to one. Just double checking here. Okay, we're way down there. We're way down there. Probably about one and a half. All right, take up our the highest position. Now let's lay down a straight stitch next to this other straight stitch to show how satinish this Swiss beauty can sew. Here we go. Trying to see if we're even moving. I've got it way down there. Are we even moving? I think we're moving just barely. Get out your magnify glass. You're going to need it. You're going to need a magnify glass on this one. Wow. Oh my goodness gravy. Wait until you see how small we got. It is... What? That's crazy. That's crazy. Absolutely crazy. Look at those two side by side. That one is like, where's the stitch? It's almost, it's so teeny tiny compared to our full scale 
straight stitch. I mean, it's just amazing the contrast, isn't it? Let's get on our stitch uh, holder and we'll take a look at these uh, next to each other. Just absolutely spectacular. Just spectacular. Where is my stitch off holder? There it is. All right, that should be about the right angle. Let me take out my knee controller so I don't bump it. Yeah, that's the only thing about knee controllers is they're, you're, you're more prone to bump into them, you know, accidentally like I did earlier uh, than a foot controller that's on the floor. I mean, your foot controller, your foot is either on it or not on it, typically. So, all right, let's go over by those sew-offs, take a look at these. So we'll look at those first two rows first. Again, we're, we're working with uh, simple disc number two, and we laid down one that was a little bit wider, and then we narrowed it down. I am way on page 34, and look at the thickness again of that protected full grain leather. Don't be deceived for a second. It is not garment leather. It's not thin stuff. Absolutely amazing. Amazing. Gorgeous stitching. Gorgeous stitching. Now let's look at that straight stitching we just did. Those two rows. You can see the one on the top easy. The one on the bottom, get out your get out your reading glasses. Get out your cheaters. Folks, that is so page 34 plus. Don't you agree? And if we were using a non-leather needle that was probably a little bit smaller. Yeah, let's just say it. Let's, let's go with a leather needle, but let's go with a smaller one, like a size 70 or 80 instead of a 90. We'd be able to get that one on the lower row even more defined. At all four at the same time. Folks, those are, wow. Let's go to right about there. Get my hand off the camera. That is absolutely the glory of the stitch right there. That is the glory of the stitch. We're down in the super satin range on the bottom. We do a, a, a gorgeous straight stitch right in the middle there. And then we lay down some beautiful simple disc number two stitching on the top two rows. I mean, absolutely as it should be. Let's flip it over. And I, I'm guessing the only uh, stitch we'll be able to see readily without pulling this material back is going to be the large straight stitch. And, and I'm right. Look at that. It's like all the other ones are invisible. All the other ones are practically invisible. But if you get really close, you can kind of kind of see them trying to pop through there. Well, I am not going to go up there and pull this apart again because you can, you can get an idea of just how beautifully this Elna 2 just did this. Again, protected full grain leather is specially prepared leather that has a coating on it to protect that leather against staining and to give it more wearability, more durability. And just look at, look at, I mean, let that straight stitch stand as a benchmark of the other stitching that we can't see as clearly on this lock stitch right now. It's absolutely spot on. Absolutely spot on. So I'm going to put this to the rear as a definite pass as we look at this stitching that is just off the charts, off the charts. Beautiful job. I'm going to throw this to the rear. And we left a little bit of space on there for Dawn or for Michelle to, uh, to sew on there as well if they'd like to. All right, let's go back to the machine. Let's go back to the machine. All right. So we've got, again, for simple discs, 
we've got one, two, three, and five. We've already experimented with one and two. Tell me what to do so we can remove this, this simple disc number two and put in simple disc number three next. What do we need to do? I mean, I gave you one already there. You gotta open the cover, duh. What else do we have to do so we can get that disc out safely and get another disc in, in its place? Type it in the chat. Tell me, tell me what to do. Okay. Well, if you typed something to the effect of, Scott, you need to take that stitch width and make sure it's down on zero, which it is, and you need to take that stitch length up here, and you need to move it down to zero as well. We were actually really close to zero, that's why that stitch was so teeny tiny. And now, by doing those two things, zero, zero, now you can push down on that thingy in the middle. And actually, I think the Swiss have a name for it. I don't remember what it is. Let me see if I can give you the name. That way you can really impress somebody and tell them what it's called. You never know. You might be at a supermarket. You might be getting your hair cut. And someone will walk up and say, what is that thing you push down in the middle? And you'll be like, oh, I know that one. I know that one. So we covered that in the premiere. Oh, that's really boring. That's all they call it? It's called a push button? Oh, come on. You you Swiss people are so clever. You came up with Elnograph, which, like phonograph, that's kind of cool. But all you call it is a push button? That's it? we got to come up with something better than that. Somebody type in the chat that we can come up with a better name for this right here. You know, something like disc ejector or who knows what you can come up with but we got to do better than push button come on that's my answer to that that was all right well i'm gonna push this thing right here and you come up with a name let me know what you think so we just ejected it it's kind of what we're doing and this again is uh disc number two now we're going to put in number three And this is what number three is supposed to generate right here. Let me bring it up to the camera. Where am I? That's number three right there. I don't even know what you'd call that kind of stitch. What would y'all call that? Almost looks like a mending stitch or something, doesn't it? Yeah, that'll be an interesting one to sew. All right, so we're going to line up our circle like you've seen me do before. Line up our little white white circle with our little pin that's sticking up right here next to our ejector. Yeah, I like that better. We're going to line those two up and we're going to push down on both sides evenly. Well, once we get it lined up, we're going to push down evenly. I think I've got it all the way down. I hope I do. Let me double check. There we go. That was all the way down. Click, click. All right. So, zero, zero. Now we can close our little door. We're going to be working with simple disc number three. So I'm going to adjust my stitch length straight away up to right around two. I'm going to adjust my stitch width to right around two. And we're going to pick out our next material that we're going to sew this with, which will probably be some of this super cool uh, genuine cowhide. You can tell it's cowhide instead of vegetable tan by how nappy the back is. Now, if we want to actually see any of these, I better fold this in half and get us those two layers that I hope, since this is going to be a little bit thinner. Let me zoom in. You can't see a thing I'm talking about. That's where having a camera person would really be beneficial, but that's okay. Let's 
go over here now. Right about to there. So what I was showing you that you never saw is I picked out some genuine cowhide now and you can tell by the nap on the back it's really nappy. It's nappish. And uh, we're going to be folding this over to go through two layers of this doing some of this decorative type stitching off of uh, simple disc number three. Simple disc number three. So let me fold that in half and I'm hoping we can fit this underneath the presser foot. I hope, I hope, I hope. Again, because of how robust those feed dogs are, we couldn't get two layers of elk hide underneath there. I was kind of bummed about that. But we are successful in getting this genuine cow hide underneath there. So yay! Yay! All right, so I got that in place. Press your foot is down. Check my presser foot pressure, should be okay. I might bump it up just a hair more. I think that should be enough. Okay, so now what we're going to do is lay down this first stitch. Let's see what we think of this one. Of course, we're not going to be able to see it until I decide to put the knee controller back in. Yeah. <clears throat> All right, here we go. And again, just to give you a perspective, we're going to be going through about six to eight ounces of leather. And again, our stitch width setting is at two. Our stitch length setting is right around two. Uh, that's going to mean a, not, a lot of rapid needle swing to get this done. So let's see what we get. This should be pretty exciting. Here we go. Kind of went crazy there launching, didn't I? But I, I, I tamed it back. I tamed it back. That's an interesting stitch, isn't it? Isn't that interesting? Can you see that in the shot? Yeah, it's kind of cool. So now what we're going to do, oh, I should check my tensioning too. Yep, we're looking okay. Looking okay. Bring my thread back. And now we're going to make an adjustment on stitch width and stitch length using the same simple disc number three and see how we can change the look of it. So again our setting right now is uh, two and two. Two on stitch length, two on stitch width. Let's get our material back in place. I'm going to take off that knee controller real quick so I don't end up launching before I'm ready. Let's get that in place. Press your foot is down. And now we're going to take our stitch width to three, our stitch length, I almost stand up and look at it here, our stitch length is going to go up to about three, and let's see how we can change the look of this stitch, same stitch, same simple disc, but we've adjusted the stitch width and the stitch length, making it a little bit wider, a little bit longer. Let's see what we think of this. All right, here we go. Oh, see that? I launched with a little bit more power the first time. This time I was a little bit more weak, and it hit that leather, those two layers of uh, genuine cowhide, and it said, ah, uh, no, no, it's not going to happen today. I didn't get any bird nesting on the bottom because I did kind of a false start. Kind of like in racing. I did a false starting racing. Nope, the machine managed managed my blunder very nicely. Okay, so this is our second stitch row. Give you a glimpse of this as well. 
So this again is going to be our, our top stitch. You can see it right there in the shot. Absolutely bang on. Beautiful. If I flip it around our lock stitch, equally drop dead gorgeous. Examine it a little bit closer real quick and see if I want to make any adjustments before we move forward from here. I'm seeing a little bit of constraining, a little bit of compression on the back uh, <clears throat> with the um, upper tension maybe pulling a little bit harder than it should. It's only very subtle. It's very, very subtle. But I think I'm going to just make a modest adjustment on that upper tension, just back it off just a hair, just a little bit. I barely adjusted it, but just slightly. So let's get it back into the position and now let's lay down uh, a straight stitch next to these uh, simple disc number three stitching. We'll lay down a straight stitch on these two layers of uh, genuine cowhide. So off camera, I'm taking my stitch width, I'm moving it from three uh, down to zero. I'm also gonna take my stitch length and move it all the way to the highest setting at uh, setting number four. So we've taken the, uh, we've taken the Elnagraph, the Elnagraph, I love that. Uh, we've taken the Elnagraph offline temporarily because we've taken the stitch width to zero, that immediately takes away the power of the cam function. I'm sorry, I said cam. It takes away the disc function. The Elnagraph is turned off. And now we're going to lay down a straight stitch uh, next to this. And we'll see what we think. And I'll try to be a little bit more generous in launching this time so I don't hit that leather and run into a stop again. All right, here we go. A straight stitch right next to these other two simple stitch number three stitch patterns. Here we go. See that? I was more decisive that time. I still only was giving it about 10% power, but what a difference, huh? What a difference. And what a drop dead gorgeous stitch that is. Wow. Wow. We'll flip it so you can see that on the top. Isn't that spectacular? Let's look at the lock stitch. I'll spin it around. You can look at the lock as well. Absolutely spot on. And I'm so glad I backed off that upper tension a little bit. We still have a beautifully nicely, dis nicely defined uh, lock stitch, but it didn't steal away the beauty of the top stitch like we've had happen a couple of times. So I am very, very pleased, very pleased with that. And again, if you've lost contact with what we're sewing and how thick it is, look at this from the side. From this side. from that side. Two layers of genuine cowhide is anything, anything but easy. That's for sure, that's for darn sure. All right, so now let's take it to the other end of the spectrum. We're gonna be shortening up that stitch length now down into the one to two range on uh, the stitch controller, stitch length controller. And we're gonna be laying down a near satin stitch next to this other stitch. We'll see what we think of that. All right, here we go. Whoops, I think I went too short. I went too short, okay. My apologies for that. Let's try it again. 
We're gonna have a little bit of a thing at the beginning because I was I, I moved the stitch de length down too far. It wasn't it wasn't advancing the material. Let's see if we uh, can get get it done this time. Here we go. Plus, I didn't have the uh, material all the way underneath the presser foot. That doesn't help either, does it? Okay. Oh, Lord have mercy. That is a tiny stitch. Oh, my goodness gravy. Wow. Look at that on top compared to the row below it where we did a, a standard straight stitch. See? When you when you when you move that stitch length down so far, plus if you don't have the material all the way underneath the presser foot, that doesn't help either. But you get a little bit of this thing on the end there, a little bit of a we have no traction, we have no movement, it's going nowhere. So we just did a little bit of a midstream adjustment. All of a sudden, we were then moving forward beautifully. Jiminy crickets. Anyone, if you ever hear anybody in those Facebook groups or other ways saying that you can't sew teeny tiny satin with an Elna, you can give them one of my for me, would you? Because you sure as heck can, that's for sure. Wow. Wow. So here's what we've done so far. Let me just check my alignment here. This is our top stitching. I'm gonna zoom in way close. Actually, you're gonna just kind of line it up, can I? Yeah, let's just line it up. That's easier. So again, we're using uh, simple disc number three. And first of all, we generated these over here on top. Then we did the straight stitching on the bottom. See, I ran it all the way down to the end since, <laughs> since I had no traction to begin with. Totality of the stitching, this is our top stitch again. Absolutely a page 34, even a page 34 plus. So if you've got an Elna 2 and you say, hey, I want to I want to sew a, a teeny tiny satin stitch like Scott did, don't go as low as I did to begin with because it's not even going to advance the material. And you can see we're not even at the lowest setting. Look at how tiny that stitch is on the lowest bottom row there. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. Let's turn around and look at that lock stitch. And as we turn it around to this lock stitch, let me just show you again what we went through crazy. This is now going to be our lock stitch. I hope it stays. Okay, this is our lock stitch. So look at those first two rows first. Absolutely gorgeous, gorgeous lock stitch. Let's look at those straight stitches now. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. Totality of the stitching. We're going to come to right about there. Folks, That the, both the top stitch and the lock stitch, these two layers of genuine cowhide, again, about eight ounces of leather sewn with this Elna 2. It's unbelievable. It's absolutely unbelievable. 
Again, this is a, did I even mention, maybe I didn't even mention, this Elna 2 is right around from 1957. 1957. And this is the level of technology they had then. We're talking like 60 plus years ago. 60 plus years ago, they already in Switzerland were laying down. It's amazing. It's amazing. I mean, yes, Husqvarna did it. Yes, Foff did some of this as well, but just absolutely phenomenal. See that? They're not just goofing around skiing in the Swiss Alps. They're doing all kinds of cool stuff like this. So this is a definite, definite pass uh, with this uh, two layers of genuine cowhide. I'm going to throw that to the back as well. And I think what we'll do real quick, yeah, I've got some uh, vegetable tan leather that we can goof around with as well. Uh, I think what we're going to do is we're going to pop over to Facebook real quick. I've got a couple more progress group shots that I want to show you. Go over by our Swiss Miss. I think she just wanted to have her picture taken there, don't you? She has kind of that look of, hey, take my picture with the machine in the background. Yeah. Hey, remind me, when we go back to the machine, I want to show you how to open up the light carriage. The light carriage is tricky on this machine, just like the bobbin. Remind me, remind me. So now we're kind of looking down at that commutator on the motor. We're starting to clean that as an integral part of the motor assembly. And there are a lot of other parts of the motor that I serviced as well. Maybe I didn't capture them all. So now we've got that side panel off that has our on off switch and we're starting to do some deep cleaning on that as well. We've already verified wiring. I don't know that we insulated the wiring yet, but you'll probably see that as well. But any of those areas that are inside of the machine uh, that are going to have access to the motor and that we want to get all that dirt out of there so it doesn't migrate over into the motor. The motor, again, is going to act like what? Type it in the chat. The motor of a machine like this, or any machine for that matter, what is it going to act like when it comes to pulling things in from the environment? Boy, there's a big hint. And you can just see what we've gotten off of there already. Look at how filthy that Q-tip swab is. Still trying to work on getting some of that uh, that oxide cleaned off of the, uh, the the copper. Trying to get those areas cleaned up and tidied up. Now there, on the end of my uh, dental tool, I've got some of that insulating material that I love to use to seal off those connection points so that the electricity is not leaking out. <clears throat> Getting all that in place, sealing off all those contacts. Now I'm carefully using my torch. Again, if you, if you decide to get a torch, be careful with it. Remember, it's about 1,000 to 1,200 degrees compared to a hair dryer that's going to be about 300 degrees. So you got to be real careful when you're around areas like this. This is plastic, that inside portion. So if you hit that with a thousand degrees in the wrong way, yeah, it's not going to make for a good day for you. And what I'm doing here is I'm using my mirror to check the back of that area to make sure that there's no insulating points that I missed. Interestingly, when I take off the bottom of the machine, I find a couple of other wires that need to be insulated as well. And there I've got on that really cool, uh, perfect, perfect. perfect, I've got on that perfect light that uh, Jose just gave me. I'm trying that out. <laughs> I think that's the one, or is that a different one? I've got a couple of different lighting hats that I use for looking close. There I am with my friend, my Swiss Miss. 
more cleaning, more insulating. It also looks like I'm holding a small little washer there that goes on the inside of that casing. <coughs> Excuse me. We've got that all done. I think we're going to button it up pretty quick. Nope, not yet. I've got to clean around the edges too. Again, we don't want to leave any dirt behind. So I'm cleaning around the edges, getting all that area that that's going to seat up against nice and clean as well. See all that filth? And again, I, I, you already know what I'm going to say. If you went to an average service center, even an above average service center, they're not going to address any of this. They're not going to take the side panel off. They're not going to verify the wiring. They're not going to insulate the wiring. They're not going to check the connections. They're not going to inspect the wiring. And they're sure as heck not going to clean this over here. All that filth is going to be there when you pay your bill of 100 to 150 bucks. Look at all that filth. I see what I'm doing. I had to look at that twice. What is that? Um, a trick that I use, and this is true of uh, the FOF machines too, when you have to take off the bottom of those FOF machines to access the motor, there's tiny little washers that have a tendency to not want to stay in place. They'll fall off, they'll drop inside of the machine. And what I do is I use a little bit of my special grease to stick that washer into position so that when I raise that side panel up it's going to stay in place so I can put those bolts back in. So that's what I'm doing. It's a little hack that I developed some time ago whenever I'm dealing with small little washers and I've got to take the machine apart to do my, my deep cleaning and service but then I've got to reassemble that machine again and I don't want those washers to slide out of position because they're there for a reason. And so that's what I'm doing right in that shot. Oh, you can actually see it more clearly now. You can see my syringe. You couldn't see it in the other one. It was a little bit more ambiguous. And also I use my little magnifier, good old-fashioned uh, magnifying glass to, to see some of the things I want to see as well. There, I kind of pressed it into place. Now we got that panel back on, and we've done all of the work that we need to do in that space to make sure that the machine is going to be... Um, operating at an optimal level and also be safe for dawn as well. That's the big deal. I always want my machines to leave the workshop safe for the customer. There I'm cleaning up that uh, friction pulley, getting all that gunk off of it so it's going to have better traction against that rim on the inside of the balance wheel. Look at all the junk I got off of that right there. And we still have more cleaning to do beyond that. <clears throat> cleaning the inside as well where that balance wheel is going to be slid back into place look at all the junk we just got off of that I just have to say it folks this is the workshop difference you're not going to get this level of service anywhere else in the world and I have to I have to make a comment here that's it's it tickled me it tickled me when I saw it you guys know that Alex uh, Askroff and I are friends and he'll he'll look at my posts I'll look at his posts and uh, he just made a post of a machine that arrived at his workshop in England and I think he said it was a starlet or a star something like that you can you can look at his post if you'd like but he commented about telling his customers before they ship their machines not to be sending machines to him amid a pandemic that are, are filthy, unkept. When you look at the machine that he's commenting on and his photo of it, or his video of it, I think he actually shoots a video of it as well. That machine is not that, not that bad compared to some of the machines that arrived at my workshop. He would just totally freak out. 
if he saw some of the machines in the condition that they arrived at the workshop, you know, with the mold and the rust and just how untidy they are. So I, I had to chuckle at that. And, and I, I say that with all respect to Alex, because we all look at the world differently. But if he spent some time at my workshop and saw some of the new arrivals, he would be like, wow. I, I, I probably could get him to say with his really cool British accent, good gravy. I would love to hear him say that, actually. Alex, if you happen to catch this premiere, next time you do a video of one of your machines arriving that's unkept and untidy, if you could say good gravy, I would really appreciate it. Yes, I would. <laughs> oh, even the Swiss miss is saying, oh, that's not as bad as I've, as I've seen. That's not as bad as I've seen. So here's our main shaft that our balance wheel mounts to. And there's just a lot of buildup on there as well. It's very, very uh, filthy. There's the way it should look. We're getting into a, a point now where it's 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 been optimized, it's been cleaned, it's been deep cleaned, and it's got to be because that's right in proximity to that motor right here. And that motor, if you didn't get it into the chat or if you didn't see it, it acts like a vacuum cleaner. A motor sucks everything in from its environment. Stuff that's inside of the case of the machine and stuff that's outside of the case of the machine that makes its way into the case, that, that motor's gonna suck it up just like a vacuum cleaner. So we wanna eliminate all of this up here so it's not gonna, we're not gonna contaminate that motor after we've optimized it. And I think there we're doing some more inspection of a spring. It looks like a spring that we're servicing right there. Oh, that's right. We took out that retainer plate and actually serviced behind that as well. That's one of the bolts that we took out there. There's the inside of that balance wheel, which I think is just a phenomenal thing, don't you? I think that's just a phenomenal balance wheel. The casting and how they make it. I would love to be in the factory where they made that. It's so cool. Doing more cleaning on that as well, on that cast aluminum getting it all cleaned up and, and optimized. Look at all that stuff we got off of it. Now it's starting to look as it should. A very busy workbench, all kinds of stuff going on. Now we've actually taken the bottom of the Elna 2 off because there's a lot of servicing to do down there as well and you can't get to it unless you take the bottom of the machine off. Plus the bottom of the machine also needs to be cleaned up as well because it's right in that pillar space that's right below the motor. And we don't want to leave any dirt and stuff that that motor is going to then suck up. See all that stuff? Now we're looking at the bottom of the motor and we're kind of looking up that pillar shaft at all the areas that need to be serviced, cleaned, and some areas have to be lubricated as well. There's actually the fan on the bottom of the Elna 2 motor. If you didn't know that, the Elna 2 motor has a fan that's going to be pulling air and also pushing heat out. That's the beginning. That's our Swiss Miss right there at the very beginning of that set. So I'm going to close that set. And here, the opening shot that we'll look at next. Oh, there's actually a message from Alex right there. I'll close that. Um, the next set we're going to look at is going to start out with our funny little party guy. I think Emma called him kind of a snowbird. He looks like he's a snowbird in his getup as he's migrating north and south as the weather changes. And our Swiss Miss has a screwdriver and also the syringe with my special grease in it as well. She's a working girl. She's not afraid to get dirty. So I'm debating right now. I think we, what we'll do is we'll go back to the machine. We'll do some more sewing. We'll probably put another one of these simple discs in. Get my light back on. 
All right, so I, I'm reinforcing learning here. Tell me what to do so we can be prepared to remove disk, um, simple disk number three, and put in the next disk, which should be number five. I don't know why they didn't have a simple disk number four. Why they did? Why the uh, the Swiss didn't just go one, two, three, four like we would in America? Instead, they went one, two, three, five. But hey, it was up to them, right? So, put on some more music, and we will continue the process of evaluating and testing this Elna 2 from 1950 what? Type it in the chat. Were you paying attention? What year is this machine from? See, I'm giving you a lot of work here. A lot of work. I'm asking you to tell me how to set this up so we can put in the next simple disk. And also asking you what year the machine is. What, what the heck is that? It's like a midterm. Give you a few seconds to type in the date of the machine. And then also what we do to set it up with this next disk. So if you said 1957, 1957, you're absolutely spot on. Well done. Well done. So the second part of the question that I asked you is, what do we need to do to get this Supermatic, this Elna 2, set up for the next sewing by putting in another, another disc? get it okay if you said make sure the stitch width is on zero make sure the stitch length is on zero open our little door and then you push down on the ejector which is a lot cooler name than they came up with and we should be able to eject the uh, simple disc number three and put in number five there we go Number three is going to go to the side. We've used that successfully. Now we're going to get simple disc number five. I'm just going to verify that that is number five. Yep, it is. And this is the stitch pattern that we'll be looking to do next. Yeah, that's number five right there. Simple disc number five. And again, you know it's not a double disc because of the thickness of it. See that? Yeah. So we're going to insert this now. And again, we've done this several times already. We're going to line up our little white circle with a little pin that's sticking up. And we will try to position it into place, pushing up both sides evenly, locking it into place like we just did. Close our little cover. And then I'm going to set our stitch length right around to uh, right around two. And I'll set our stitch width two right around two and then we'll head down to the needle and I think we're going to be doing vegetable tan leather next we're going to be doing vegetable tan leather next just seeing if it's going to stop moving anytime soon <laughs> it's got to be the tripod it's not the camera the camera is just sitting on the tripod it's got to be the tripod is somehow being naughty all right I think that'll stay now okay so now we're going to pull out some of this vegetable tan leather and you can tell straight away why it's vegetable tan instead of Italian leather or genuine cowhide because the nap on this is so flat it doesn't have that real nappy look to it. It's got a much flatter nap to it. So we're going to fold this in half. We're not going to have nearly as much space to work with unless maybe I fold it. Let me fold it like this. That would be, means a shorter stitch roll, but it gives us a lot more workspace, doesn't it? So let me slide this into position. To 
keep an eye on my uh, spool of thread. This, these are smaller spools. They only have, a, I think, 125 yards, and I do a lot of stitch-offs during these premieres, so I could run out straight away. All right, so that's down now. Take up arms all the way at the highest position. All right, so we have a simple disc number five in there now, number five. We slide my knee controller in, and let's give this a try. And I'll try to be fairly generous, but I, I'm not gonna have as long of a stitch line, so I, I don't wanna run over the leather either. So let's give this a go. Here we go. That was fun, wasn't it? Yeah, that was kind of fun. Yeah, I've, I've got that so short that it's it's almost indistinguishable in what we just sewed. You kind of can make it out. So we're going to be making some adjustments on this just so we can get different looks of the same simple disc number five based on manipulating uh, stitch length and stitch width. <clears throat> Let me get this back into place. <clears throat> we'll do our next stitch line next to this one, but we'll make some adjustments on stitch length and stitch width. Turn this volume down. Okay, so right now we're on two on stitch width. I'm going to go ahead and take it to three. And uh, I'm also going to take our... You know what? Before I do that, let me, let me do this differently. We were on two on stitch width. I'm going to leave it on two, but I'm going to take our stitch length from where it's at right now on two to a shorter stitch. Let's go short and then we'll go long. So I'm going to take it down to about one and a half and we'll see what impact we can have on the look of this and then we're going to go the opposite way. We're going to go wider and longer and see how we can change the look of this particular uh, simple disc uh, number five. Okay so take up arm all the way up. Let's see what we think of this. Here we go. It changed the look of it a little bit. I think when we go the opposite direction, we'll get even more of a dramatic change on it. That's the fun of experimentation, right? Yeah. I do like working with vegetable tan leather. I don't know that I use it as much as Dusty does over in Colorado, uh, but I do like it. I do like it. And when I, when I have it, I use it. So now off camera, I'm changing our stitch width from two up to three, and I'm also going to take our stitch length up to three as well. Let's see what we get this time. All right, here we go. It's interesting. It's very interesting. I was debating if I should go super, super short, but I think we have enough short representation. So now we're going to change our stitch width back to zero, which will take the um, Elnagraph. I love that. The Elnagraph, it'll take the Elnagraph offline. It'll shut it off. So we're going to do that straight away. And then we're going to, and obviously I didn't say it, but you, you're really smart. Um, whenever you're making changes on any machine, changing levers, changing buttons, changing knobs, changing, adjusting that machine in any way, always make sure your needle is clear of the material. 
I usually say that a lot, and I haven't said it as much because I just figured you guys are so dang on smart. So what I'm doing now is I'm going to move our stitch length from three all the way up to four. I take our stitch width down to zero, and now we're going to be laying down a simple straight stitch uh, next to these other stitch outputs for simple disc number five that we just inserted in the machine. All right, here we go. Whoa, hang on there, buddy. I didn't have a good grip on the material, and this material is naturally a little bit slippery. And I, you saw the material, it was like, ah, blah, 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 blah. All right, pay attention, Scott. Pay attention, buddy. Pay attention. Just seeing if we want to make any adjustments at all. I'm going to leave it exactly the way it is. All right. And now we're going to be moving that stitch length way down. And we're going to be uh, stitching off a near satin stitch. I won't make it quite as short this time because last time I decided to go so crazy with it that it was the material wasn't even moving. So let's let's see if we can get it in that sweet spot this time. All right, let's see. We're going to go right about to one, right around the one, I think. All right. Take a palm all the way up. Here we go. Near satin straight stitch. Here we go. Oh, two layers of uh, vegetable tan leather. About uh, six to eight ounces of leather. <laughs> I went too short again. Oh my goodness, that's so funny. All right, here we go. I said I wasn't gonna do it and I did it anyway. That's so funny. Oh my gosh, wait until you see how tiny this is. That's just downright ridiculous. That is downright ridiculous. What am I doing on thread? We're hanging in there. I like these littler spools, but I, it, it's one more thing that I have to focus on then. Am I running out of thread? With all the sew-offs that I do, Someone else that did it like window dressing, they wouldn't give a hoot. You know what, we'll do one more stitch since we have room. See what we've done so far? These are the, uh, I always wanna say cam. These are the disc stitches here, one, two, three. Then we did the straight stitch, then we did a teeny tiny little straight stitch uh, next to that. I'm gonna go extreme and do one more cam stitch, but we're gonna go four and four and just see how different it looks. Presser foot is down, so off camera, I'm taking my stitch width all the way to four. I'm taking my stitch length all the way to four. We're going max, max. All right, take up arm is at the highest position. This is our last stitch on this vegetable tan leather. And then I'll just leave a little space where if Dawn or Michelle want to sew it, they can do that. All right, you ready? Here we go. That kind of moves quick, doesn't it? <laughs> oh gosh that's so funny all right get our sew off holder and we'll uh, take a look at these all right take up Take out that knee controller so I don't bump it. All right, we'll look at these first. I'm deciding if I want to display them like horizontal or vertical. Go like this. There we go. So this is our top stitch through two layers of vegetable tan leather. Two layers of vegetable tan leather. And we'll look at them in kind of the order that we did them. Uh, this again is going to be simple disc number five. Uh, we'll look at those first two stitch rows that we did. I've got to angle that just a little bit more. Hang on just a second. As the camera continues to move. There we go. That's a little bit better. 
All right, let's try that again. So these first two rows are the uh, stitches we generated with simple uh, disc number five. Again, when you're using the simple discs uh, or the, the thin discs, uh, the cam is not going to be controlling the feed dogs. It's only on the double discs that the feed dogs are controlled. Pretty much everything is controlled by the disc when you use the, uh, the, uh, the, th the double discs. So those are absolutely spectacular. Beautiful, beautiful top stitching. drop down to the next row. Hold on just a second. Okay, there we go. I'm ready now. So here's another one where we went using the same simple disc, but we, we changed the width on it dramatically. Actually, I think we left the width the same and we changed the length, didn't we? At any rate, all three of these rows are simple disc number five with this Elna 2. All spectacular. And again, look at the edge of that. Probably almost eight ounces of vegetable tan leather. There's our straight stitch. Let's actually look at both of these at the same time. There's our straight stitch at max and our straight stitch very, very minimal. Almost down the satin range. I didn't say it yet. We are absolutely at a solid page 34 on this top stitching. Absolutely drop dead gorgeous. And then we goofed around on the last one. Again, an output of the uh, simple disc number 5. And we went max 4, max 4 on the length and the width and that's what it generated totality of the stitching come right about to there totality folks I am incredibly impressed vegetable tan leather is not a super easy leather to stitch especially two layers of it and this Elna 2 from 1957 just did an incredible, incredible job. Incredible job. I did say 57, didn't I? Yeah, 1957. The other, the other thing I didn't mention about the significance of 1957 is that's the same year that Alex was born, Alex Askroff. So I'll just make that honorable mention. I know some of you are probably also born in 1957 as well. If you were born in 1957 and you're not afraid to admit it, type in the chat, 1957. What a great year that was. I was still a twinkle in my daddy's eye. I wasn't born yet. So now we're looking at the lock stitch. Again, these were generated by simple disc number five. And that lock stitch is absolutely spot on. Absolutely spot on. Dropping down now to when we uh, left the width, I believe, the same, but we maxed out the length, and we got a product like that. Then we did a straight stitch, I believe. Pause right there. And that's when I launched, and I think I lost control of the leather, so you'll see kind of the, the, the stitches don't track. That's when it almost got out of my fingers. But that is an absolute page 34, if not a page 34 plus uh, straight stitch. We drop down to the next row. Actually, we'll look at these two at the same time. We set that length way down, way, 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 way down into the satin range and laid down just a gorgeous teeny tiny stitch. You almost need a magnifier, don't you? The stitch, the stitch length range on this machine is really phenomenal. You just have to rethink it because it's 1 through 4. It's not 6 through 30, like I said. And then finally, we goofed around and we set that uh, stitch length and stitch width at max. And that's what we generated using this simple disc number 5. To tally the uh, lock stitching... 
trying to get the camera to cooperate there. Absolutely page 34 without a doubt. And again, this is two layers of vegetable tan leather, about eight ounces of leather, folks. Nothing to, nothing to scoff at. And we did it with incredible needle swing on some of these uh, simple disc number five stitch outputs. So very impressed, very, very solid. I'm going to throw that to the back with our growing sew-off sandwich. And I didn't even show it to you yet. We'll just take a quick peek at it. This is our simple sew-off sandwich so far. Got to bring it all the way down here because that's the way the camera is angled right now. So everything from satin to cowhide to vegetable tan leather to 100% uh, polyester to 100% cotton. I mean, already we've run th this Elna 2 through just a ton of different tests, but we're not done yet. We're not done. Plus, on the same needle, as you already know, I showed you this. We did this uh, protected full grain leather and this denim as well off camera. So that's also part of this equation as well in testing this machine. So I'm going to add that to our sew-off sandwich. So now we're up to this. That's the real deal, folks. That's the way anyone that is a credible restorer should be testing their machines before they return that machine to their customer. Not one of these lazy daisy type sew-offs where they get a couple of pieces of uh, cotton blend or something like that. They put a stiffener in, the, stiffener in the middle and they run off a couple of stitch lines. That's not genuinely testing the machine. It really isn't. Not in my opinion anyway. <clears throat> so now we're going to take this uh, machine back to uh, straight stitching only. Although we could do some... Uh... No, you know what? No, but let's, let's not do that yet. Let's, let's see if we can do a double cam. That would be fun, wouldn't it? We haven't done a double cam. What do we have to do before we can potentially insert a double cam? What do we need to do? <clears throat> I'm just looking at these double cams real quick to see which one we might want to give a go. Oh, that's fun. That's a fun one. <clears throat> this is a fun one too. This is almost like a, a Swiss symbol. We got to try this one. This is a uh, uh, double cam number 110. Double cam number 110. Let me show you this one. This is so, so utterly Swiss. This is so utterly Swiss. Don't you agree? Once it focuses, you'll, you'll possibly agree. Come on. Finally! What, were you out to lunch there, camera, or what? So we're going to try to do this double cam that uh, has, looks like the Swiss cross almost, doesn't it? Let's give that a go. So if you said in the chat, Scott, in order to remove cam 5 that's in there right now, so you can put in this double cam, you've got to, number one, open the door, take your stitch width down to zero, take your stitch length to zero, Push your ejector, a much cooler name. Remove that disc. And then insert your double disc, which you can see straight away. This is the one that we just took out on the left. This is the one on the right that we're putting in. It's so obvious how different they are, isn't it? Yeah. So again, we're going to line up our little white circle with the pin that's on the front of there. Again, both of our settings are on zero right now. We're going to push it down just like we did. The other thing I, I failed to mention is that this machine also, if you have the correct cam to insert, you can also do automatic, excuse me, you can also do automatic buttonholing as well. And this is the little mechanism right back here 
that allows you to do automatic buttonholing. You have to kind of push this back. You have to kind of push that back when you're doing the auto buttonholing and then put your special buttonholing type cam thingy in there and then you can do auto buttonholing with this as well. It's kind of a cool little mechanism, isn't it? I like things that have springs, unless I have to replace them. Yeah, so that's in place. I'm gonna close our little door. Now we have to do something special because it's a double disc instead of a single disc. What do we have to do, do you remember? This was way at the beginning of the premiere. We have to move our stitch length to a special position. If you typed in the chat, we have to move it down to the A and lock it down to the A so that that cam can not only control the, uh, the width and length to some extent, but also the feed dogs, and you're absolutely spot on. We gotta move that all the way down, lock it in place. Listen for that click. So now we're ready to use that double, double cam, that double thick Oreo thing. Sucker, you know what I mean. So what should we sew it on? That's the question. Do I have anything left that I can sew it on? I don't think I do. I might have to grab something real quick. Why don't I grab some denim? That'd be fun to sew on, wouldn't it? Hang on just a second. Let me grab some denim. I did off-camera denim. I didn't do... I didn't prep any denim to sew on camera. Turn this music up a little bit while I'm cutting this material. This is, uh, in case you wondered, this is denim cutting material. Yes, it is. In case you were wondering, I actually was cutting it, see? <laughs> oh, Jiminy Crickets. All right, let me set that right there. All right, let's try this double cam. I did not try this off camera, so this should be horribly exciting. The only other thing we need to do, obviously, is we have to move this from zero to somewhere between one and four, uh, because otherwise, all we're gonna do is get a straight stitch. So I'm gonna move that over to, to two. We'll try two first, and then we'll goof around with some other things after that. Okay, so we'll start on two, then we'll try three on stitch width. We're not going to do a thing with this. This has to stay over on, on the A. And I'll zoom in on that so you can see that. So when you're using the double discs, the thicker ones, it's kind of hard to see, isn't it? But we've got it on A, any rate. Moved it all the way down and clicked it into A. And this, with this we're not going to touch at all while we're using this double cam. Or double disc, rather. And then I've got this on two on the stitch width. So let's head down here and see what we get. All right, so I've locked that in place. And again, it's gonna take control. The double disc is gonna control our feed dogs as well. So it'll be interesting to see what it does with the feed dogs. Absolutely. So we're going to be laying this uh, double disc stitch down on uh, two layers of denim. So I might just do a slight back off of our presser foot pressure. We don't have leather underneath there right now. Um, I backed it off just a little bit and put it back on that default setting where it's got the two little... Um, oh, what would you... See? Let me show you. <laughs> 
I'm at that point in the premiere where my brain is pretty fried, so let me I'll show you where we have it set. This is where I'm setting it for our double um, Oreo sew-off. Guess I'm thinking of Oreos, aren't I? And this is where we had it for the leather. I'll show you again. That's where we had it set for the leather. So we'll give this a go. That should be more than enough press wood pressure for two layers of uh, denim. There's going to be a lot of activity, though, as far as that uh, those feed dogs being manipulated by the disc, uh, the double disc. Didn't I say 110, right? This is double disc uh, 110 that we're using. All right. And I, I just want to clarify something I said earlier that was a little bit unclear. You can use the case on this machine as an extension arm. In other words, you could slide it up to the free arm and you could... You could have additional workspace. I just don't like to do that uh, with this machine. It's just not real convenient. And uh, it, yeah, we're gonna just use the free arm, so. All right, so let's see what we get with this. We'll take our take-up arm to the highest position and then we'll see what we get with this uh, double disc. Once I put the uh, knee controller into the machine, otherwise we're not going to be sewing anything. Yeah. All right, here we go. Hold on a second. Turn that music way down. <laughs> I couldn't help myself. I had to rev it a little bit at the end. Just had to rev it a little bit. Just a wee bit. Okay. Oh, that is cool. It almost looks like a Chevy symbol. That's kind of cool. Oh, that's right. I forgot to adjust my upper tension, so... Um, our top stitch looks great. Our lock stitch on the bottom is so taut that you can barely make it out. So I got to fix that right now. We're on six right now on upper tension. I'm going to back that off a little bit. Let me just make sure that my diagnosis is spot on. Hold on just a second. Yeah, it's too tight. It's too tight. So we're going to back that off from six down to about just above five. Actually, I'll put it right at about five. We'll do our next st stitch line. The only thing we can adjust with these double discs is going to be the stitch width. So we did two. Now we're going to go up to three. We'll sew it again with that upper tension adjustment and see if that uh, helps resolve uh, giving more uh, definition to that lock stitch on the bottom. Because right now our stitch is uh, it's so tight you can barely make out what it is. Alright, so that's back down. I'm going to take our stitch width up to three. Nothing else we're able to manipulate because the uh, disc is going to control it, including the feed dog. So let's give this a try again. Uh, the only change we made is to take stitch width from two to three. Here we go. Oh, and, and we adjusted our upper tension as well. We adjusted it back from six to five. All right, here we go.
thread. Okay, yeah, we're okay on thread. And obviously we're not going to get the same level of definition that we would if we were, there we go, there we go, yep, 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 that's what we had to do. Uh, we're not going to get the same level of definition if using a leather needle on denim as we would if we were using a denim needle. <laughs> it's, kind of, it's kind of obvious, right? But we're not going to let that be an obstacle. This machine is running so tip top that we are going to, uh, we're going to, uh, continue to get great outcomes even though our setup isn't absolutely perfect. Okay, let me get that back into place again. Just double checking, do I have that correct? Yes, I do. Okay, and based on what I'm seeing, let me just double check. Yeah, based on what I'm seeing, I'm going to back off that upper tension even a little bit more for this double disc uh, sewing for pattern. Uh, this is pattern 110. Uh, I'm set at uh, 5 right now. I'm even going to back it off just a hair more. Just a hair more. Okay. And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to take that stitch width controller from 3 all the way to four. Again, we don't do a thing with stitch length. It's locked down in that A setting on the stitch length controller. And so all we do is manipulate the stitch width to get different outcomes. Okay, take up arm at the highest position. This will be our last stitch off with this, uh, this particular double disc. We might pop another double disc in after this. All right, here we go. Hopefully I don't run out of bobbin thread. Look at that needle movement. Oh my gosh. That needle movement is just insane in concert with how that cam is manipulating the feed dogs as well. Absolutely amazing. And again, this is technology from the 1950s, over 60 years ago. The only one that we didn't try with this particular double cam was putting the stitch width all the way down on one, but I think that's kind of ridiculous because even on this one where we did two, we did two, check my camera shot. Yeah, we did two on the stitch width, three on the stitch width, and then four on the stitch width. This was so tiny on two, it's, it's almost nonsensical. So I think, I think skipping one on stitch width with this double uh, disc was, was the right choice. But really a cool stitch pattern with incredible needle movement. It's just mind-blowing. If you, if you can see that needle working uh, to generate this stitch, it's just it's quite phenomenal. And another tip from me learning is this is our lock stitch that we're looking at right here. I had my upper tension way too high when we did this initial stitch on the top row and it was pulling that thread so taut you could barely make out the pattern. Then we backed it off here, we backed it off a little bit more here. We could even back it off just a hair more because on the, uh, the upper tension control there's a default marker and we're just a little bit above it right now with this output right here. So we're almost, I think we're almost in that sweet spot where you want to follow that default marker on the upper tension. There's a little, like a white dot that we're almost at when you're using these, uh, these double discs. So I think we, we learned our lesson as we were experimenting and getting some really good outcomes. So I think what we'll do is we'll put this material back in place. 
uh, and we'll do one more double disc and uh, and then we'll uh, hope we have enough hoping we have enough thread you see where yeah we've got enough thread we're good that's a good thing about these uh, bobbins on uh, this Elna 2 they hold a ton of thread they really really do So what we're going to do is we're going to change the shot. We're going to take out this double disc. We'll put in another double disc. We'll go to we'll go back to Facebook, do some uh, progress shots. We'll go through those, and then this will be our last sew off. I had other stuff prepared, but we've done a ton of sewing on this Elna two, and uh, I think I think we have more than put it through a sewing Olympics at this point, and we still have this other sew off to do as well. So. Take out that knee controller so it'll bump it. So as you can see in the shot right now, we're not set up at a point right now where we can safely remove this double uh, disc. We've got to take our stitch width all the way down to zero. We've got to take our stitch length all the way back up to zero to remove this. But we have, remember, you have to push this in. You can't just force it up. you got to push this in, and then you can move it up again so make sure you push it in don't try to jam it so we're going to take it back up to zero 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 open our little door hit our little ejector and our disc popped out beautifully we're going to set that to the side and now i'm going to try to pick out another double disc uh, that we can uh, install in the machine and then we'll head over to facebook for just a wee bit see Dawn has a number of double discs that her grandmother had with this machine so I'm going to see just look at these real quick I think we'll pick this one out of any of the other double discs uh, this is the most intricate one I think it's the coolest one it's kind of what I would call a catacomb so the one we did with kind of the uh, Swiss cross was uh, Pattern disc, uh, pattern double disc, uh, 110, and what we're going to be doing now is pattern disc uh, 101, 101. Let me see if I can show it to you if the camera will be good. This is pattern 101. I can't see my little screen. Hopefully you can see what that is. Yeah, you can. So that's 101. So we did 110 first. Again, a double disc. This is going to be 101. 101. Okay? So let's get it in the machine. Again, you're going to line up your little white circle with the little pin that's sticking up on the cam stack. Excuse me. On the Elna graph. Get nasty notes from Switzerland. my line up again oh it was off a little bit there we go so it snapped in beautifully close our door and we'll, we'll follow the same suit on this one we'll set our width on two we'll set our stitch length on what we got to set it on a don't we we got to bring it all the way down and lock it in on the a that's the thing with the double discs again. On the double discs, the ones that are noticeably wider. So you can see that in the shot. The ones that are noticeably wider, you always have to set that stitch length on A. You don't have any discretion on stitch length because it's going to control stitch length. It's also going to control the feed dogs. When you're using these skinnier ones, you have some discretion in setting your stitch length and width and the machine will be managing the feed dogs not the cam or not the uh, disc rather this disc will control the feed dogs the stitch length the only discretion you have is stitch width all you have is stitch width the skinnier one you have discretion on stitch length width and the machine will manipulate the feed dogs automatically uh, not the uh, disc make sense Okay, groovy. 
All right, so we're all set up for this last sew off that we're going to use with our disc 101, our double disc 101, I should say, double disc 101. Now we're going to look at some more Facebook progress shots. Okay, we're going to look at these next. Head over to Facebook. And our Swiss Miss obviously is a working girl. She's got her screwdriver. She's got her syringe. And she's ready to go to work. She's already been doing work, as a matter of fact. So here we're looking uh, again from the bottom of the machine. We've taken the bottom of the machine off. We're inspecting the cleated belt. This is a cleated style belt like you'll see on the Foff machines. You'll see them on um, the, the Husqvarna's as well. A lot of the European uh, makers chose to use this belt because they're phenomenal. They're long lasting. Uh, and again, whenever you have a cleated style belt, it's gonna have um, interlacing uh, gears uh, that are going to feed right into this. They're gonna. There's not going to be any opportunity for slippage. There's a really nice shot of the cleated style belt. The only problem with these is they're no longer they're lo no longer made. So, uh, I mean, if if you can find a supply of them to replace them, thankfully. The one that was on this Elna was in very good service. I had to do cleanup on it, but the, uh, the the nylon and stuff that goes with the cleats themselves was in excellent shape. Here's some of our gears, some of our worm gears uh, that are into that area of the free arm, and they have to be serviced and cleaned. And also because they were inadequately lubricated. Uh, I'm also checking them for chipping as well. Further inspections. I get very deep into the machines. Again, a service on an Elna 2 like this will be about 14 to 16 hours compared to if you took it to a local service center where they would spend about 45 minutes to an hour on it. So about 14 to 16 times longer is how long my service is on a machine like this. And there I'm just checking the movement of the release on the bottom and the spring in relation to the knee controller. I think I show a closer shot of that as well. Yep, that's the spring return right there that's part of the knee controller assembly. It's a more distant shot just showing the busyness of the workbench. Again, part of that mechanism, a lot of moving parts, a lot of servicing and optimization has to be done on that. A lot of servicing, a lot of optimization. What I'm checking here is there's a special Allen screw that's an integral part of that assembly. And I'm using a small, a you can't see in this shot how small it is, a tiny little Allen wrench to adjust that. There I've got some bare wires again, so I'm using my special insulating uh, epoxy to seal those off so the electricity is not leaking. You can see that more clearly in that shot there. More insulating. Quick drying it, and you have to be really careful uh, because the gauge wiring they use on these Elnas is closer to an 18 gauge, not a 16 gauge. Uh, and it's got a very thin coating, so you can, you can fry it real quick with 1,000 degrees. And there it is, quick dried. Kind of like freeze dried, but it's quick dried. Some deep cleaning, I'm having to use tweezers and a Q-tip to get into some of those areas from the bottom. 
special flushing solution for the motor. Also, I'm using additional flushing solution uh, with a special syringe that uh, Maddie sent me from Florida. I've got syringes like this, but hers have a special tip on them. So that's really a nice advantage. So thank you again for that, Maddie. Flushing that area out on the bottom region of the motor. We've already cleaned it from the top. Now we're cleaning it from the bottom. There's our bottom cover that's going to go back. It's our basically our base for the bottom of the machine. And we've got to get that cleaned up before we marry the two back together again. Otherwise, we're going to be taking a clean area and introducing it to the dirty bottom, which wouldn't make any sense. Some people wouldn't give it a second thought, but you got to look at it logically. I mean, you don't want to contaminate an area that you just cleaned. It's, it's foolish. There, I put a special cleaning solvent on there that's safe for the paint, and I'm trying to get some of that extra gunk off of there. And that's what an optimized clean base looks like. Additional servicing and cleaning in the bottom region of the uh, Elna. Getting a lot of filth off of there. And also uh, checking uh, those gears from this side using my flashlight as well, checking for damage on them. Again, they did not have proper grease on them, so that metal was slamming in the metal. That's all the old, useless, dried out, caramelized, fossilized grease uh, that was on there. It also looked like somebody had added regular machine oil to gears. Never, ever, 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 ever put oil on gears. Uh, the only exception to that is there are some Singer designs that have real tight woven uh, worm style gears right off of the main shaft and on those, according to Singer, you can use oil on those instead of grease, but I use, I use grease anyway. It's more long lasting and it provides cushion that oil doesn't. That's my special pink grease. But again, you don't put that on until that surface has been cleaned. more cleaning and that's the mounting base of the of the bottom of the free arm that that base is going to be connecting back up to that's what it looks like when it's clean clear difference very clear difference we're about at a point right now where the base of that machine is uh, clean all of the service points have been dealt with all of the wiring has been insulated and it's and inspected um, adjustments have been made the cleated belt has been cleaned and inspected, and now we're ready to put that uh, base back on the machine again. <clears throat> the thing we discover, though, as we look at that base is there's an issue with the feet. Uh, the feet that should pro provide a soft cushion for that machine and eliminate vibration are to a point where they're totally way past their expiration date. You'll see what I mean. Isn't that horrible? That's to a point where it's just no longer providing any float. It's not providing any cushion. It's not eliminating any of the vibration factor at all for the machine. All four of them were like that. And there are no, af there are no aftermarket, there are no replacements available out there for replacing these. So I had to create my own solution. See how bad off those are? Those are so dried out and so brittle that they're not, they're not eliminating any vibration at all for the machine when it's operating. So we're gonna get them off of there and we're gonna create our own. Those are the old ones down there. Got to get that surface nice and clean, nice and clean. 
Now we're using some uh, some great non-skid type uh, pedestal feet where we're going to be double stacking them and then using a special adhesive to mount them to the base of the machine. You'll see those different steps happening. We have to use a punch and we also have to drill them out as well. That's the end of that series. So now we're on the top of the machine. That's going to be our Elna Graph, as they call it. They're kind of playing off of the words phonograph, obviously. You see how filthy it is, along with our ejector. So all of this area up here has to be serviced now. Cool shot of our Swiss Miss. Continue to work on those pedestal feet. If you've ever had a sewing machine that doesn't have good pedestal feet on the bottom and adequate cushion, you know what it is to sew with a machine like that. The thing is rattling, it's vibrating, uh, it's just it's very uncomfortable, very unpleasant. So we're trying to deal with that now so that uh, Dawn doesn't have to deal with it once she gets the machine back. The machine could be sewing perfectly, but if it's rattling all over the place, that's not a, that's not a, a pleasant experience to have when you're sewing. So I'm kind of just showing our Swiss Miss what I've come up with as far as the solution. That's layer number one. Almost looks like a waffle, doesn't it? Kind of making me hungry. Preparing it for layer number two. And that's layer number two in place now. It's going to provide a, a beautiful soft cushion and support and stability for the machine and just allow you to float through sewing without having to be concerned about any extra vibration or anything like that. Kind of see it from the side how much thickness I've added to that that wasn't there before. Innovation is a core principle of the workshop. We run into an obstacle, whether it's during a live premiere or when it's by myself in the workshop with the boys, we're going to figure out a way to get around it or to get through it. Two of them are now in place. Getting the other ones ready for the other side of the machine. There we go. Now we've got a good sewing surface. And as I'm drilling, I sometimes we drill too deep, so I went into my little board, which is fine. That's what, it, that's what it's there for. Here we're going to dig into the free arm area. There's a lot of, lot of areas to service, ser, service in the free arm area. There's some of our worm style gears. They're almost kind of a combination of a worm and a miter type gear based on what I showed you recently on one of the premieres. But whatever kind of gear they are, whatever you want to argue that they are, they need to be properly cleaned and they need to have a proper grease so that they're not slamming into each other. There's also a spring return on there as well. All springs have to be cleaned and properly lubricated. I've talked about the, uh, the feed dogs. I would say the Swiss probably came up with the finest feed dogs out of any maker that I've ever had the privilege to sit down to as far as machine. They're a grid style uh, feed dog that provides even better traction and feed than the tooth style ones that you'll see most commonly on machines. Really some phenomenal Swiss engineering. They had just provided a little bit more clearance. That would be that would be the perfect solution. See how much further they stick up? And that's why we couldn't sew those two layers of uh, elk hide.
Now what we're looking at here is the side of the, bo uh, the bobbin carrier. This is the way you adjust tension on it right here with this little disc. The normal setting is going to be one and uh, then you can increase or decrease it uh, accordingly. And they call this, I want to get the specific term that they use, universal something. Hold on a second. We've got to find it in the book. Oh, I expected something a lot more creative. I just found it in the book. Let me show you. I think I can show you. Universal tension. That's not horribly impressive, but that's what they call that little uh, disc down there that you can adjust. You can kind of see it there in the shot. Uh, anywhere from zero up to two is the highest setting on it, I believe. Typically, you're going to have it on one, and the one should be pointing at this little point right here when you're setting it. I'm just working on optimizing that entire area. Going through the entire faceplate. And the Swiss are smart like the Germans. Uh, any of the areas that they feel are critical and they miss a lot of areas as far as marking them with a red ring. But you can see some of these areas that they marked with a red ring just to remind people these are the most critical lubrication points in the faceplate, but there's a ton more that they didn't mark in red. But you can see in the shot right there clearly that they've marked them. There are just more areas in the faceplate area, also near the uh, presser foot lever as well. As well. Very well engineered machine, very well built. They were looking at the presser foot bar, doing some cleaning and optimization of that as well. More distant shot with our lady kind of looking on, our Swiss Miss kind of checking things out. There I'm just showing her in the manual some of the specifics on the machine. There again is our uh, Elna graph that we've got to clean up. See how filthy it is? We're going to be putting those uh, discs on there. I want to have a clean surface. You can see our little pin set right there that we line up that white circle with? All of that area right now is just filthy. It's just awful. And I think here I'm showing the Swiss Miss. I think I'm showing her the guarantee for the Elena that was included in the owner's manual that'll be returned to uh, Dawn obviously when she comes to pick up the machine with Michelle and the guarantee that I'm showing it's a guarantee bond I'll show you as well looks something like this yeah I'll show you the I'll show you it as best as I can Elna Sewing Machine Company guarantees against defects or blah blah blah, breakage resulting from blah 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 within the time frame outlined on the guarantee. So it's not an unconditional, unlimited guarantee. Uh, there's a specific time frame where you can make a claim against uh, a defect on the machine. But again, because of the way these machines are engineered, you're not likely to encounter very many issues with them. And there our uh, Florida boy, our snowbird as Emma refers to him as hanging out with the uh, Swiss Miss. And they're just kind of celebrating the near end getting us ready for this uh, premiere. I think that's full circle isn't it? I believe it's full circle. Yeah. It's full circle. There you go. And again, I've said this before in other premieres, um, and this is especially true when you uh, when you think about uh, 
the recent 66-1 also that was brought to the workshop by Michelle and by Dawn and, and her other friend, uh, where I had just a bazillion sets of progress photos because there was so much to show as far as what I had done to that Class 66 machine that Dawn and Michelle brought to the workshop. Uh, matter of fact, it's still on the workbench from the recent premiere. I haven't prepped it in, uh, in preparation for them to pick it up yet. There it is. Beautiful machine. But you need to check out that premiere because I go through eight sets of photos showing all the steps and the things that I did this to that machine. But it's still only a fraction of the steps that I took the machine through. I don't even take, I mean, if I took all those pictures, it, it would be mind blowing. But I try to capture a lot of them just so you can appreciate the impact that I was able to bring to that machine. So, so with all that blah, 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 let's do our final stitch offs now. We're going to basically do three more stitch offs using this, uh, this disc, double disc number 101. Our first double disc that we did just prior to this was 110, I believe. Now we're going to be doing this next double disc, so that'll be kind of fun to see this one. And I picked one out of the double discs that are in that set that belonged to Dawn that was probably the most intricate. So, And we're going to be doing this with a leather needle, so it'll be interesting sewing a, a stitch of this intricacy on denim with a leather needle. But hey, it's the way of the workshop. We always like to push the limits, right? Yeah, we do. Okay, let me get this light back on. Let's do these final sew-offs with this fabulous Elna from the latter 1950s, right around 1957. Let's make sure I have that all the way underneath the presser foot, otherwise it's not going to feed. There we go. Okay, so again, when you're using the double discs, all you have control over is the stitch width. The feed dogs are controlled by the disc. The stitch length is controlled by the disc. And so our choices are very limited. And we're gonna start with a stitch width of two, then we're gonna go to three, and then finally we're gonna go to four. Okay, you ready? All right, here we go. Making sure the material is actually advancing. Looks like it is. Just making sure we don't run out of thread. Oh my gosh. Yeah, that's so narrow. We're just using a ton of thread. We are advancing, but it's very, very slow. It's very, very slow. This is such an intense pattern. We're, we're barely going to be able to make it out. I'm not going to sew all the way down. We're going to get down about halfway and I'm going to stop. And then we're going to go to our next row and increase the stitch width. Because this is such an intricate uh, pattern on this uh, disc 101. It almost looks like we made a mending stitch. Okay, I'm going to stop right there. All right, pull this up. Yeah, you can barely, you can barely make it out. See what we did? It's so intense and it's so narrow because we have the stitch width on two, which it tells us we can do that. We can choose the stitch width as we see fit, but it's so, it's so tight you can't even really make out the intricacy of this particular pattern on this double disc uh, 101. So we're going to make the stitch width wider and go to our next row. And because we're so low on uh, thread, we might just do the same length on the next one as well. We'll see. We'll see. I actually was questioning if we were advancing. It was so intense. It was so crazy intense. But 
but this is really in my in my opinion this is a showcase stitch it's a super cool showcase stitch and I really want to give this an opportunity to shine okay so there's our row that we just did you can kind of look at it along with the other ones that we've already done now we're going to widen it and we'll be able to see more of that definition So I'm moving our stitch width from two up to three. And we're gonna duplicate the same thing. But this time we'll be able to spread that out a little bit more and see more of the definition. All right, here we go. Do I actually have it all the way underneath the no, I don't. Doggone it. I didn't have it all the way underneath the uh, the presser foot. Give me a second here. That's the only tricky thing about this presser foot is it looks like you're all the way underneath it, but you're not. So we were getting no, no traction, no feet of the material there. All right, take two. <clears throat> Matter of fact, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to cut that top edge off. It's like they say in Las Vegas, like it never happened, so. All right, there we go. Now we're gonna start afresh. <laughs> All right, let's get that into position. All right, take two, take two. Checking to make sure that I'm all the way underneath the uh, presser foot this time. All right, let's give this a try again. Here we go. <clears throat> yeah, we're getting really low on thread. dealing with a stitch of this intricacy you were just testing and kind of experimenting with different things with a stitch width but really to be able to see the intricacy of a catacomb stitch like this we could have started on four and gone backwards but I went the opposite way so it is what it is we'll be able to compare the two and uh, and that way when you're doing this on your Elna 2 you can say I'm not even gonna bother with two or three, I'm just gonna go right to four. And that's probably the right decision. But learning is also learning what not to do by doing it. It's kind of like when uh, Edison came up with the light bulb, someone interviewed him and said, you know, was that a waste of time going through all those other steps before you finally discovered how to make the light bulb? He said, no. I learned 999 ways not to, how not to make a light bulb. Yeah, we're starting to get it now. We're starting to get that, that definition that we were looking for. Now we're gonna go to four and do one more, one final stitch row. Again, we're not gonna get the clarity of stitch using a leather needle on denim that we could using a universal or a denim needle, but we're gonna get some of that at least which is great. Okay, so, so far, this is what we got. You see it right there in the shot. The one on the left is obviously gonna be when we were on the stitch width three, no, two rather. Stitch width two, stitch width three. So now we're gonna move our stitch width to four and try one more uh, stitch row with the longest, the widest stitch width setting that we can with this uh, particular double cam, double disc rather, double disc 101 is what we're, we're working with. Okay? 
Just making sure I still have enough bobbin thread left. It looks like I do. All right, so our final stitch row using this double disc 101. Moving it over to four. And we'll execute this and see what we get. See what we get. See what we think. Here we go. Checking my thread on the back. Just turn down the music for this final stitch line. And stop. Yeah, there's more definition, but still we're not going to get as much as if we used uh, probably a, a needle that's going to give us a little bit different punch through as far as that uh, pattern. But boy, is that an intense is that ever an intense pattern? Oh my goodness. Let's look at these three. So comparatively you can just kind of see them in the shot. The one on the the one on the far left is our first. I actually don't mind that one too much. It's kind of cool. And we had our, this was again on uh, stitch width setting two, stitch width setting three, and then finally stitch width setting four. I'd almost be curious with this pattern to try stitch width one. I'd be kind of curious to see what that looks like. If we have enough thread, maybe we'll pull that one off. I could actually put it just below this one. Then we could go like one, two, three, four. Put our put our one right down here. Yeah, that would be kind of neat. And it, it, inevitably, when you have a, a machine, uh, you'll like certain pattern uh, outputs better than others. You just will. So we'll try that. We'll we'll tuck it in right here. We'll put we'll move our stitch width to one. And we'll do one last little stitch row with stitch width one, just out of curiosity to see how it's going to lay down. All right, let's give this a go. This is our final stitch row right here. This is going to be really, really tight.
All right, we're gonna stop right there. All we need is an impression of kind of how it presents. Yeah, that's interesting. Little or no room with an inter intricate pattern like that to fit in there with such a narrow stitch width, but it's interesting. Kind of interesting. Yeah, that's correct. That's the, way, that's the way it should be. So let me set this up on the stitch off uh, holder and we'll take a look at all these that we just generated with this uh, double disc. Uh, the first part of it is uh, pattern 110 double disc and then pattern 101 double disc. And there's other double discs to pick from as well that we could have chosen, I just didn't choose them. So totality of the stitching, again on the left we're looking at double disc 110, the first three rows, and then the next three rows, kind of three and a half rows, <laughs> is our double disc uh, 101. So yeah, the first three rows 110, the last three rows uh, 101. Yeah, this is obviously our top stitch. Kind of zoom in on that a little bit, kind of go down. I'm a bigger fan of the uh, 110. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Especially when we lengthen the uh, stitch width on the far right there. Yeah. Let me loosen this camera just a little bit. I'm getting kind of jerky with it. Let's move over to these. These are interesting. They're interesting. I'm not sure exactly the best application for them. If you have an opinion on how you would use these, and obviously you wouldn't, let's just let's just start with the reality here. You wouldn't be sewing on two layers of denim using a leather needle. Like, like we are right now. Uh, you'd be using a more appropriate needle, a denim needle, You'd be using maybe a higher grade thread. Nothing wrong with dual duty. Don't don't send me any nasty notes, or Coates and Clark. Don't send me any nasty notes about me implying that uh, dual du dual duty thread is not a a sufficient caliber thread. It is, or I wouldn't be using it. I'm just saying that there are finer threads. There's there's Guterman, and there's other threads like that that would probably give us even a, a more a much greater clarity of pattern. Okay. There, I left it like that. Okay? You know what I'm saying, right, Swiss Miss? Where is she? Where'd she go? There you are. Yeah, she totally gets it. She knows what I'm saying. So, we could get different outcomes by just changing our setup. But on the far left, obviously, we started uh, right here. We started with a, a stitch width setting of two. Then we went crazy and went all the way down to a stitch width setting of one down here. It's interesting, isn't it? It's interesting. Then we have a stitch width setting of three right there in the middle. And then last but certainly not least, we had a stitch width setting of four right over here. Yeah, it almost, it almost makes me think of a caterpillar now as I'm looking at it. How about you? Does it make you think of a caterpillar? That pattern uh, 101 on the far right yeah, but the bottom line is, however you look at these double Oreo type uh, disc patterns, um, it gives us an opportunity to put this machine through the paces, put it through the test, put it through our sewing Olympics. And when you look at the totality of uh, not the stitching, we didn't do that. Totality of stitching, there we go. Oh, we didn't even look at the lock stitch, duh. You tell that I'm getting a little bit worn, ar worn around the edges. So let's flip it over and look at the lock stitch. Oh my gosh. There's our lock stitch on the back side there. No difference. 
it's a mirror image because the machine is sewing at the top of its game. Well, with the exception of when I started over here and I had the tension way too high. See, when the tension is set so high and you try to look for that lock stitch, it's like, okay, where is it? It's because that upper tension is yanking it so hard into the denim, it's making it disappear. But we adjusted it, remember that? I said, oh, wow, the upper tension is too high. We backed it off, and then we started to get some really great, uh, let's just start from the top. We started to get some really great uh, stitch definition and clarity on this denim with that lock stitch. And that again was uh, uh, double disc uh, 110, 110. Then we went to double disc 101, and we laid down some also equally cool <clears throat> lock stitching on there as well. Totality of the lock stitching. Both of these on these double discs, whether you're looking at the far right with the uh, the uh, disc uh, 110 or the far left with uh, double disc 101, they're equally impressive in different ways, different applications. Uh, and there's certainly other patterns that we could have sewed that we just didn't choose to sew. Uh, lots of choices with this Elna uh, 2. So that's the double Oreo sewing that we did. Just to remind you again as we come out on the shot of this incredible machine that belongs to Dawn from the great city of Cass, Cass City, Michigan, I think if I'm saying that correctly. Look at all the other show-offs we did during this premiere and a few of them off camera as well. I'll add our double Oreo stitching to it as well. So to, just to revisit again what a Sewing Olympics looks like, that's what it looks like right there. That's what a machine has to accomplish in one form or another before it's allowed to graduate from the workshop and head home with its owner or to be shipped back to its owner if the machine has come to the workshop. That's the real deal, folks. That's the way every machine, in my opinion, should be tested before that restorer or technician or whatever they call themselves, aficionado, VSM aficionado, uh, that's what they should be running that machine through. Because what if that owner only wants to sew elk hide and you don't sew elk hide? Or only wants to sew satin? Or only wants to sew 100% polyester? or 100% cotton, or protected full grain leather, or vegetable tan leather, or actually this is cowhide, cowhide, vegetable tan leather, or other types of leather, and that machine is never tested to sew that particular material, that fabric. You've set that owner up for failure instead of success. That is not what I want to do. So this machine is officially graduated and with that, I'm going to finally remember to ring the bell. I oftentimes forget, but I argue that that's because we never stop learning. And so class is never officially closed. That's, that's my, yeah, that's my argument anyway. So Dawn, Michelle, and your unnamed friend, <laughs> let me just say thank you so much for the opportunity of taking care of these three machines for you. This uh, incredible Elna 2, also known as the Elna, Elna Supermatic, your incredible Mighty Spartan, your 192K, and last but certainly not least, that incredible 66-1. All of these machines had specific needs. Some of them spent more time in the ICU of the workshop than others, but the bottom line is we've got three incredible, mach three incredible machines heading back to Cass City, Michigan. Uh, to be enjoyed by these various owners. So thank you, ladies. Safe travels uh, coming here to pick up the machines. Safe travels when you head back home to carry these treasures back with you. And if you get more machines, bring them along. The more the merrier, right? All right, y'all take care. Let's get some music to wrap this up. Oh, what should we put on? I think we'll do trumpet, and I'm going to do a little bit of playing. I feel like I need to do a little bit of playing here.
All right, let's do a bit, a little bit of playing to wrap up this premiere. Here we go. Now, I usually would get my trumpet out to play this, but I'm going to play harmonica with trumpet instead. Well, thanks again for the opportunity. If you've never seen an Elna 2, an Elna Supermatic, do all of the things that you saw it do, this is what it looks like. God bless.